In any case, it's a great pleasure to be with you today, so so much for the commercial introduction. For those of you who have come to our events in the past, we're ha happy to have you. And for those of you who are here for the first time, recognize the fact this is a not-for-profit organization. We're a 501c3. Those of you who are inclined to write checks, please, please do so. It would be London Center for Policy Research. Thank you very much for being here again. And now let me make a couple of introductions, and I will try to be very brief. I have asphalt in my blood, so I speak very quickly. The first person I want to introduce is the woman who is largely responsible for underwriting this event, Lenore Brock. Lenore, please stand up. It's her generosity that has made this event possible. <laughs> Lenore is a brilliant Vermont resident who has traveled all the way to New York to help us with this event, and I can't thank her enough and her friend Rob who is with us as well. So thank you again, Lenore, and for those of you who are here for the first time, let me remind you we have a number of events. The listing of those events is all in the material that we have outside. Now let me make a very, very brief statement about this particular conference. We are engaged in an ideological war. There is no doubt in my mind that it is not what happens on the battlefield only. It is also what the United States stands for as a nation. And one of the issues that I've written about a great deal is that there has been a loss of confidence about what the United States stands for. A loss of confidence that I think in some respects is unusual. We have an extraordinary system in so many ways. Moment wrote a book many years ago called My Love Affair with America. I have a love affair with America. But I must say that there's a lot about America I no longer recognize. We are not so sure about what it is we are as a nation. And when we have foes on the world stage that have a fanatical view of what they believe in, and we are not sure what we believe any longer, they have a distinct advantage. Why do we ignore the romance in our past? Several years ago, I had to give a speech at James Madison University, and I said to the assembled students, in another generation, you're not going to know who James Madison is. Now, this is astonishing, that in the United States, people are unaware of their own history, their own background, when there is so much to take pride in. Students have almost thought, know nothing about their own history. The universities, as I've indicated before, do not help in this enterprise, largely because we now have a core curriculum that does not specify anything that students should know. I'm reminded of a comment that was made by a former mentor of mine and someone who I greatly admired, Sam Huntington. Sam wrote the following. A world without U.S. primacy will be a world with more violence and disorder and less democracy and economic growth than a world where the United States continues to have influence than any other country in shaping global affairs. The sustained international primacy of the United States is control to the welfare and security of Americans and the future of freedom, democracy, open economics, and international order. I believe very much in what Sam wrote many years ago. I believe it even more today. And a reminder of the story of a former football player, yes, there were great football players at Columbia in another generation, named Sid Luckman. <laughs> Sid was uh, drafted by the Chicago Bears. And in his first game against the Green Bay Packers playing in Soldier's Field, he invited his mother. Now his mother, never went to a Columbia football game, knew nothing about Sid Luckman's career. And in fact, she was a European. So she goes to Soldier Field wearing an elegant dress. Quite inappropriate for a football game when the temperature is like 10 degrees. At the end of the game, which the Bears won and Luckman had quite a successful game, passing for 23 out of 30 passes over 300 yards, and the Bears beat the Packers. She comes into the locker room and said, Sydney, are you all right? I said, Mom, look what happened today. It was a great game. It was fabulous. We won the game. She said, Sydney, I don't understand what was going on out there. There are these big, angry men. They're running after you. They want to hurt you. Why don't you just give them the ball? <laughs> Sid looked at her and said, Mom, in football, we don't give up the ball. Now, that was an American statement. We don't give up the ball. I'm not so sure about that anymore. And that is really one of the topics that we're here to discuss today. Do we give up the ball and under what circumstances? Are we still the Americans that stand for something for the that Sam Huntington made reference to in his extraordinary statement decades ago? 
The first speaker, and I'm going to introduce all three speakers, and rather than introduce them in Suriyam, I'm just going to introduce them quite arbitrarily. But let me introduce Doug McGregor first. Doug is a, a remarkable fellow in so many ways. At the moment, he's the executive vice president of the Burke McGregor Group. You can read all about him in the document that is outside. Colonel McGregor is a decorated combat veteran and author of four books, a PhD. He was commissioned in the U.S. Army in 1976 after one year at the Virginia Military Institute and four years at West Point. In 1991, McGregor was awarded the Bronze Star with a B, a device for valor for the leadership under his combat troops. In this, uh, this was in the 2nd Armored Cavalry Regiment for his personal leadership of the cavalry troops in Cougar Squadron in the action that became known as the Battle of the 73 Easting, the U.S. Army's largest tank battle since World War II. Colonel McGregor is a remarkable man in so many ways, and I've had the great pleasure of spending some time with him in a recent article that he wrote that I thought was really quite interesting, entitled, Four Guns, Fewer Generals. I think you get a sense, you'll get a sense of someone who has thought long and deeply about the nature of our military, how we deploy our troops, and how we should think about military affairs. Ted Babin uh, is someone that I regard as, and I've said this on many different occasions, as a brother who was, I was separated from at birth. Uh, he's a former Air Force officer, served as a Deputy Undersecretary of Defense for George W. Bush. He is the best-selling author of In the Words of the Enemies, Inside the Asylum, What the United Nations and Old Europe Are Worse Than They Think, Showdown, Why Ch uh, Ch China Wants War with the United States, and he has served as the editor of Human Events. Many of you know Jeb because he's very often on radio and TV, has served as a sub for Jerry Doyle and for Rush Limbaugh, so he has been a personality very much on the public stage. The third person I, I want to introduce is my dear friend, Norman Pahor. Someone once said, what do you do for a living, bird? And I said, I introduce Norman Pahor. I've done this on so many occasions, and it's in large part something that I very much enjoy because I have such extraordinary admiration for Norman. Norman is a person who so many of my generation stood on the shoulders of Norman in order to get a better view of the world. He was the person who provided the guidance, the leadership, the understanding of how changes were occurring on the world stage. Henry Kissinger on one single occasion said when I introduced him at an event, and Norman von Horitz talked about him as well. He said, Norman attacked me from the left, Norman attacked me from the right, and then he says, I'm a moving target. Now, Norman has attacked many people on the left and the right, but always with justification, always with care, always with nuance. And so it is always a pleasure and a privilege to be in his company. Our first speaker, Jed Babbitt.
got to rethink what we want to do. Are we going to do? This is what I want you to think about what I'm talking today. Do we want to be a superpower? We are not one right now for a variety of reasons, most of which go back to both the Iraq War and our current president's willful dereliction of duty. He's been surrendering American power in very many ways for so long, there really is not a lot left. We don't have the ability to influence world events that we once did, once not very long ago, like eight years ago. We don't have the ability to defend this nation as we might and should and be able to, well, the ways we need to. We don't have the ability to gather intelligence that we need to and we want to, <clears throat> and frankly, we should. So those things are all in the calculation of whether we want to be a superpower. So please think about that. We talk about threats all the time, and we think about threat tactics. We give them a lot more credence than they're worth because we're thinking about electromagnetic pulse, we're thinking about cyber war, we're thinking about supercavitating torpedoes. Anybody know what a supercavitating torpedo is? Fine, don't love you. There's one oddball in every crowd. All right, seriously. <laughs> don't worry about that stuff for the simple reason. someone is a nation or someone is a non-state actor like Al-Qaeda, unless you have the person behind it, the nation behind it, the ideology behind it, then a threat tactic is not a threat. And I worry, frankly, I'll tell you a lot, I worry a lot more about French fries going to my waistline than French nuclear weapons. You know, it's, it's the kind of thing that you have to place in context. So where are we? We're going to look at some nations, we're going to think about where, well, how we're going to deal with them, and we're going to think about their, their capabilities and intentions. That's the way we're always taught in the military to think about nations, capabilities and intentions. And most of the time, you're going to find a capability and a lack of intention, or you're going to find an intention and a lack of capability, so it doesn't really add up to a big threat. Now, on everybody's mind today, well, we've got a couple of potential adversaries. And that book that Herb referred to, I wrote several years ago, is a very unfortunately titled one. I think it was not correct to say that China wants war with the United States. I think China needs war with the United States. They need it to pursue their ambitions. And unless they have us back down, they're going to run into us over Japan, over South Korea, over a variety of other nations and interests we have in that area. So China can be a big problem right now. They have the most active cyber war and cyber espionage capability in the world. We have attacks against the Defense Department and defense industry and financial industry and a whole bunch of other capable sectors in the United States from China, mainly from Guangdong province. They come in roughly 1,000 per day and probably more than that by now. My figures are a couple of months old, so they've probably gotten even more intense since their anti-satellite weapons, things that can knock out our satellites, as we're going to be talking about in a little while, they are a strategic concern, not just a tactical concern. Well, and of course, everybody's worried about the Crimea these days. Well, I guess everybody except Vichy John. Portrait that hangs in Vladimir Putin's office. It's of the Tsar Peter the Great. Now, anyone who is outside the White House bubble and might be slightly less narcissistic would understand that there are significances to that. Peter the Great, the Tsar of all the Russias, was very eager to add to his collection of all the Russias. And in the days, I guess he was the Tsar up until about 1752, and he acquired means, mostly force, Estonia, Latvia, and Finland. Uh, it seems to me that if you look at Mr. Putin correctly, you will see that he is doing exactly what Russia normally does, and he is doing exactly what his idol, Peter the Great, used to do. So pardon me, President Obama, but you're just dead bang wrong on that. This is what
what the Russia normally does. And pardon me, Secretary Kerry, but it seems to me if you look at history, and again, those who, of us who don't have to suffer living in the White House bubble have the chance to do that. You might realize that Mr. Putin, it may be in the 21st century, but he's an 18th century man. He's not someone who thinks in terms that the grandee, uh, the grandees of State Department diplomacy might say, well, those are our kinds of people. They're not. But that is something that we don't deal with these days. Well, you look at Russia, uh, as one former defense secretary uh, once told me, their military equipment is generally crap. Uh, but they have a very good technology, and they're trying to build on it. They're doing better every year. Uh, and they're trying to sell things, and they do sell things to a lot of different nations. They're spreading their influence that way. And their cyber war, as Estonia and uh, Georgia and Ukraine can testify, their cyber war capability is pretty darn good. And Russia, oh, by the way, they are uh, seeking naval bases and military bases in eight nations right now as we speak. I think it's uh, Cuba, Venezuela, Nicaragua, Algeria, Cyprus, the Seychelles, Vietnam, and Singapore. And that's just to start the long count of where Mr. Putin wants to go. In short, Russia is adversary. Are they a singular adversary? No. Are they the most dangerous adversary? No. Are they an enemy right now? Are they a proximate danger to the United States? No, probably not. And I think and uh, I was speaking to a, a dear friend of mine who heard knows uh, former Virginia governor, Jim Gilmore, who is a uh, Russia expert in his own right. And he was saying, well, you know, I think Russia is playing a losing hand. Their economy really can't sustain this kind of military growth. And their aggression in various places like the Crimea, their support for Bashar Assad, that's pretty much draining their economy. And that's about as much as they're going to be able to do for a while. I think Jim's right. I think long run, we're probably going to see more gains by Putin because we are weak and for no other reason. I'm going to keep coming back to that theme again and again and again as we talk. The fact of the matter is, Rumsfeld was right. Weakness is provocative. We are provoking our adversaries as much as we have in living memory. And quite frankly, even more. So we have Russia. Well, we have China. And we have, what are we going to deal with them? NATO? No. NATO shot its bolt in Libya. It's really not capable of doing anything militarily anymore, anywhere. Uh, the European nations are much more concerned about manufacturing goods and selling things to other people. Uh, the European Union, whatever. Uh, whether their problems resolve or not doesn't really matter in terms of national security to us. But it does matter to national security to them because they have not had they have had more interest in global warming than in national security for the past 20 or 30 years. And let me just say, that ending on the subject of NATO, it's not useful anymore. The nations of the European Union need to be told by us that NATO is not going to work unless you people invest in your own defense. And please, oh, by the way, don't count on us to defend you unless you're willing to invest in your own defense. Now, most of you saw, I think it was about 10 days ago, an article in the Wall Street Journal that talked about how Europe is emasculating itself and how the contributions to their own defenses go country to country. And I think we spend excuse me, about 4.5% of our GDP on defense. The next highest amongst the NATO nations was Britain at 2.4. And you go back to Italy, which has essentially no defense spending, Spain, et cetera, et cetera. What right do they have at this point to get a free ride any longer, I say not. I think if they don't defend themselves, they're not going Essential terrorist nation. They are, quite frankly, uh, leading us into the big 
biggest mistake we've made in many, many years, the nuclear agreement President Obama has with Iran is going to stimulate us to basically give them enough time and enough ability to get a nuclear weapon. And when that happens, if that happens, if no one stops them from getting that, the entire geopolitical picture changes, not just in the Middle East, but all across Europe and pretty much everywhere else too. So this is something we can't afford to have happen, yet this is what we're doing. Right now, <clears throat> I'm sure you all heard yesterday, the moderate, the moderate Mr. Rouhani, the reformer who is now president of Iran, has just named as their UN ambassador a terrorist, and has no other description for it, one of the people who took hostages at the U.S. Embassy in Tehran in 1979 and held those people for 444 days. This is a man they're now saying, well, we're going to give him, we want him to get a visa to come to the United States as our national, our ambassador to the United Nations. Well, it seems to me that this is some place we need to call a halt. They're doing this. They're testing us. And you've got to keep in mind all of the things that you see around the world in terms of aggression by nations, aggression by terrorist groups, these are people who are, number one, pursuing our own goals, number two, testing us. This is a test for us which we are going to fail. Appointing a terrorist hostage taker as UN ambassador is a great provocation if we do not reject his visa, and we won't because Mr. Obama has so much energy expended in this nuclear deal, he will not reject that visa. This is something which is rubbing our noses in our failure, our failure to deal with probably have seen at some point the great aerial satellite photo of the Korean Peninsula that was taken, I think, in about 2006. And it shows North Korea and South Korea. South Korea is a blaze in light. This picture was taken at like 2 o'clock in the morning. And everything there, all the cities, a lot of places in the countryside, they're all brightly lit up. When you go above the demilitarized zone, it's pitch black, except for Pyongyang, the, the capital of Syria so far. 
Syria is, of course, a battle between the two segments of Islam. I always kind of get a big chuckle out of the fact that people tell me, well, there's only one Islam. Well, okay, if you've got the Sunni and the Shia, just for starters, so there's a lot of wiggle room there. But the point of the matter is they are very different. And when you see the Sunni and the Shia split as they are over Syria, the Sunni are, of course, Saudi Arabia. tools in the intelligence community to do it the right way. The CIA, I am told by people who should know, is going back to the days of Stansfield Turner and the uh, Carter administration, uh, the late and unloved Mr. Carter. Uh, he's not late yet, but uh, anyway, uh, Mr. <laughs> Carter is still very well unloved. You know, the point was that his CIA director, Admiral Stansfield Turner, decided that we didn't need spies anymore. All we needed was fancy satellites, and it was great. My satellite costs about a billion dollars a piece, and it costs about $250 million in addition to launch one, but they can see everything. Well, they can, and they don't. We still need the spy satellites, and we still need a lot of other satellites, but the fact of the matter is, going away from human intelligence puts a blinder on us that we cannot afford to have. We end up doing things like we have with our special operations. suffered in disproportionate levels of casualties, not just because they go where nobody else can, not just because they're the first tool a president has in his toolbox, and there are very few presidential tools anymore. The fact is, these guys get stuck with the worst jobs in any event. I, I will come back to that at some point. I'm very passionate about that. But the casualties See 
ourselves in different terms. You know, we are the biggest big guy, <clears throat> so we can't beat up on the little guy. And we didn't fight the war as we should have. We lost the Vietnam War for two big reasons, and we didn't learn these lessons. You fight wars only, only, only when there's a vital national security interest at stake, a vital U.S. national security interest. Now that interest may be the survival of Israel, it may be the survival of the United States, it may be a, a free access to, to space or to the sea or to cyber war, whatever. There are different things we need to have to function in the world, <clears throat> but you don't fight a war. You don't risk losing American lives unless you have a vital national security interest, unlike mil the military adventure of President, President Obama pursued in Libya, and that was certainly not a vital national security interest. We have no vital national security interest in Syria. It's really not a war against Islam qua Islam, but it is a war against some very fundamental Islamic ideas and ideals. You cannot have democracy in a nation which follows Sharia law. It just cannot happen. You cannot separate church and state by religious law. You can't have democracy. You cannot have tolerance of other religions. You cannot have the freedoms that we enjoy every single day under the Constitution of the United States. Those are things that you cannot do. So what do you have in this war? You have, <clears throat> pardon, Islam is more an ideology than it is a religion. It is an integrated system of beliefs upon which a system of government is intended to be based. That's how you identify an ideology. And Islam is exactly that. It governs every aspect of life, and it governs every aspect of societal behavior, it governs every aspect of international relations. And that is an integrated system of belief upon which a government is supposed to be based. So Islam has an ideology, it is an ideology. And we are losing the kinetic part in places, we lost it in Iraq, we are losing it in Afghanistan. We are doing that because we have refused to fight ideological war. We have to prove to the terrorists that their ideology has failed, that it is as bankrupt as Nazism and communism. And until we do that, until we do that, we can't win the kinetic war. We have refused to fight this war. It's not like we don't know it's there. <clears throat> Pardon me. If you look at the memoirs, and I've studied the memoirs of Bush, Cheney, Rumsfeld, and Tony Blair, and the only one who really comes out and says there is an ideological war we have to win is Tony Blair. A British liberal, for heaven's sake, got it right and everybody else got it wrong. Now, I will say in some defense, you know, I don't want to defend Mr. Bush, and I think Mr. Cheney was probably aware of the ideological war and the need to fight it, but he did not back the idea of it. Mr. Bush never understood. He was too busy peddling the idea that Islam is a religion of peace. I'm told by a source close to Mr. Rumsfeld that at one point he had a dinner in his home in St. Michael's, Maryland, at which he invited all of the, to which he invited heads of relevant, ag relevant agencies, you know, the Voice of America and so forth, trying to recruit them to fight an ideological war. This is probably back in 2003 or 2002. No takers. If you look back to what General Peter Case said when he first became chairman of
understood. They blogged real time. They had people you know, basically setting up phony battle scenes. They literally were digging up bodies to create the pictures that labeled Israel as a war criminal. This is what people do because what you say and what you write and what you broadcast is just as important, maybe even more important in some cases, than what you shoot. We have to understand that. Bush never understood that. Blair is the only one, but even he gets it wrong. Blair gets it wrong. On January, well, two months ago, three months ago, he said, and I quote, there is one thing self-evidently in common. The acts of terrorism are perpetrated by people motivated by an abuse of religion. It is a perversion of faith, end quote. Well, excuse me, it's not. Uh, it is not, and I can certainly defer to Waleed on this. I don't want to get into it too much, but it's not a perversion of Islam. We can talk about all those aspects of Islam and you know, what was drafted the Quran first and after. And I'm just not going to go into that. <clears throat> Whether or not it is a perversion of Islam, we have to fight these ideas. We have to do several things, one of which is not possible. Now, none of these things are possible under the current regime in Washington. But you need presidential involvement. You need someone who is not afraid to engage in the ideological Ronald Reagan knew how to engage in the ideological war. Calling it the evil empire was just the simplest example. But he was relentlessly going after the Soviet Union and the communist world to show how we are better, to show that they are a bankrupt ideology and ours is not. We need to be doing that. We'll never do that with President Obama. Part of this is American exceptionalism to show that our system is better. And part is it's merely a comparison. Hey, what do you guys want? suicide, poverty. Uh, we offer the object of prosperity, liberty, freedoms, you know, making your own decisions about how you worship or whatever, uh, which is better. You know, obviously ours shows up there, but I'm making light of it when I should. But this is the kind of thing that has to be done relentlessly. And there needs to be one other thing that we've not been able to do and not had the courage to do, is to put a lot more pressure, a lot more pressure, on the so-called we're always told, again, mentioned a couple minutes ago, yes, there's only one Islam. <clears throat> well, there's not. There's the Sunni and the Shia, and there's so many others. There's, there are a lot of people who are Muslim who are not the enemy. These are people who we need to reach out to, but we also need to put pressure on. These people need to be told that you need to stand up. You, need to, you, you want to claim to be part of the free world. You want to claim to be something other than the terrorists, you need to stand up and say, those guys are wrong. Those guys are evil. We are not part of them. Why don't they say that? Because they are scared, partly. And partly because they really may just believe what the terrorists believe. They just don't want to act it out. So we need to put a lot more pressure on it. Anyway, there's a lot of different ways that we have to put pressure on these people and a lot of different ways we have to fight this ideological war which we are not doing. Right now, we don't have a military strategy. <clears throat> we don't have a strategic vision for the country. We don't have anything in terms of an intelligence strategy. What we basically have is a set of documents that say nothing about what our interests really are. Well, they, they kind of do. If you look at what strategy published by Obama says, well, it's in great Churchillian tones. We're going to defend freedom wherever it needs to be defended. And we're going to go to the last corners of the earth to defend it. The actions don't meet with the promises. And if you look at those documents, as I have, I'm sure many of you have, there's a couple of things. Or Islam, or terrorism. You know, those things, if you cannot even name the enemy, and this guy doesn't even have the courage of Harry Potter. He doesn't say Voldemort. He doesn't say Jihad. How can you fight an enemy that you don't have the courage to name? You can't. We don't also have the other most, well, one of the other most important parts of the strategy. We don't have an economic strategy. Because I'm here to tell you today, and you already know this, America's economy has been the engine of freedom around the world since before World War II. And right now we are on a course that, frankly, will not permit us to be a superpower until our economy recovers. 
Do we want to be a superpower? A superpower is one that can project its interests beyond its borders. You can defend your own country, okay, you're, you're a power, but you're not a superpower. A superpower can defend its interests anywhere in the world. Now, what are our interests? Well, we started to talk about that a minute ago. There's four freedoms. Freedom to see, freedom to sky, freedom of space, and freedom of the cyber. Those are things which we all have the ability to function in right now, our governments do. But we have to maintain those freedoms. We have a national strategic interest in maintaining them. If you want to be a superpower, you cannot without prosperity. We have to find a way to revive the prosperity of this economy in order to be able to afford to be a power, far less a superpower. And I would refer you to, well, I mentioned Jim Gilmore. Oh boy, I'm way beyond my time. <clears throat> anyway, there's a lot of things that can be done about this. I was mentioning very quickly, and let me just run through a couple other things here really fast. I apologize for going so long. We have very strategic concerns in maintaining our satellites. We can't do pretty much anything. We can't navigate, we can't communicate, we can't do reconnaissance, we can't do espionage without them. China's threat against them is a very big, big threat. We used to have a means of developing a military strategy and a military budget called defense guidance. In the very early days, we did, <clears throat> pardon me, uh, the comparison of the intelligence to determine the threats to what we have and what we need. We don't do that anymore. The quadrennial defense review is a joke. Uh, if you talk about some of the things we're doing right now in pursuit of it, and I'm going past my time, I apologize, but the basic two more points. We have the strategic interest in what we in terms of defense systems. What you buy determines how you're going to be able to fight. And we have some very bad examples right now. The F-35, all I can say about it is it's if you spend enough money and you spend enough time, eventually you may be able to make the F-35 work. Right now it doesn't. It's a ramp queen. The software was apparently created by the people who created the Obamacare website software. <laughs> and you have an airplane that can't fly 63% of the time because the software is down. That's outrageous. It's insane. We're spending $400 billion on that aircraft. It will cost a trillion with a T to maintain it over its life. And it will be, according to Aviation Week magazine, it will absorb 25% of all three services, weapons acquisition budgets for its lifetime. That's 50 years. We, it's insanity to do that. There's other things going on, and we can talk about that until we're blue in the face. But let me leave you with one thought. Perhaps the worst defense thought that came out in the past 50 years was when Former Defense Secretary Gates, he was Defense Secretary then in 2006, he said, I've noticed the troubling tendency, which is a paraphrase, that we have in next war itis. There's too much thought about next war itis in the Pentagon. I heard that, I said, damn it, that's your job. The point is, next war itis is all about. You're not planning five or ten years ahead, and we're not. You're not able to be able to meet the threats that are going to face us. Anyway, I've overrun my time. Thank you very much for your indulgence. I'll be uh, happy to answer questions at the right time. Thank you very much, Dr. Ferdinand. I want to make mention of the fact that many of our advisory board members and board of trustees are with us today, and thank you very much. I'm not going to mention you by name, but thank you for being here. I also want to make mention of the fact that there are about half a dozen Vietnam vets who are here today who have contributed to them as well. And third, uh, there's a senior fellow at the Hudson Institute who is not only a good friend and a hero of mine, but someone who has served this country so well when he served in the Congress. I only wish he were there today, but I'm sure that we can hear a lot of that on the national stage, and that's Alan West. <laughs> Alan, Alan Ford, from Florida, so thank you very much for being with us. And now, Doug McGregor, Colonel McGregor. The floor is yours, sir. Okay, first of all, it's uh, wonderful to be here. I love leaving Washington. It doesn't matter where you go in the United States, Kansas City, Missouri, where I was recently, or Benton, Tennessee, or Bristol, Virginia, or New York City. 
it's always refreshing to talk who are surprisingly out of touch with their representatives in Washington. I must that's a joke. They're out of touch with you, but that's not the way people in Washington do it. Give you a quick example. This morning I got off the elevator and immediately this attractive woman, very aggressive woman, walked up to me, grabbed me by the lapel and said, Carl McGregor, uh, uh, why is it that there is no original thought in Washington? And I thought about that and I decided I would answer that question in this presentation. Some of you may have been to Washington, and if you had, you've driven on the Beltway. And you know that around the Beltway on either side, you have these enormous sound barriers, or at least that's what people think they are, giant walls. I'm sure you've seen them, have you? Yes? Good. Those are not sound barriers. Those are microwave emitters. And what happens is at 5 o'clock in the morning in the Pentagon, a lieutenant colonel in the Army staff goes to the basement and flips a switch and those giant microwave emitters begin to emit. And on the way to work, on the Beltway in downtown Washington, everyone's brain is turning to mush. <laughs> now, when, when rush hour is over, at about 10 o'clock in the morning, that Lieutenant Colonel goes back downstairs, flips the switch, turns off the microwave emitters so that the brain recovers enough by the end of the day that they can return home successfully. That is why there is no original. So having solved that mystery, uh, I'm going to take a, a somewhat different approach to my predecessor uh, and, and share a couple of uh, viewpoints. First of all, I spent most of my life in the professional military, and I enjoyed it immensely. The best years of my life were spent in the Army. I was sorry when I left it. I would like to have stayed longer, but it was time for me to go. When I look at the world today, I see certain things, both inside the United States and outside the United States, and I travel quite a bit overseas. First of all, inside the United States, it's very obvious that the American people are not interested under any circumstances for any reason committing American military power beyond its borders today. If any of you question that, I would recommend that you do two things. First, go to the Pew Research site, to the website, and look at the polling data. It's overwhelmingly overwhelmingly opposed to use of American military power overseas. Secondly, I would tell you to talk to congressmen and senators on the Hill and ask them what happened when Mr. Obama proposed to bomb Syria. And they will tell you that the phones rang off the hooks, the email poured in, the telegrams poured in because there was universal opposition to doing anything in Syria. Keep in mind that only probably half of the American electorate that didn't want to bomb Syria actually knew where it was. <laughs> no one wants to do anything. Secondly, there is no immediate military threat to the United States today beyond its borders. Now, that's a condition that will not last, but it's true right now. It's true for many reasons. First of all, the entire world is struggling to recover economically. We are all struggling under a mountain of debt. Now, I don't know when the, the final reckoning with debt will come, but at some point it will. At some point we will climb out from under it. Whether we watch the currency or we restructure, which we've done in the past in this country, we've restructured twice, once in 32 and again in 34. Restructuring means effectively default. You go to your creditor and you restructure. Those things will probably happen. When they do, things will really begin to take off. We can do a lot of things economically, particularly in energy, agriculture, and high-tech manufacturing. The government is obstructing all of it. It's tragic. It's unfortunate. We are in the best position of all the major powers in the world to rapidly take off and recover economically whenever it happens. But for the moment, the rest of the world is not interested in a major war. We're not going to have one. But we will have a major war, I am afraid, in 10, 15, at the outside, 20 years. And that's what we must now begin to prepare for in earnest. Wars, contrary to popular belief, are not won on the day of battle. I know we love Hollywood movies. We think that George Patton showed up in North Africa, looked through his field glasses and said, I read your book and won the battle. Nonsense. You win wars decades in advance by investment in the right capability, the right organization, the right leadership, the right human capital. That's how you win wars. That's how the Second World War was ultimately fought, and in some cases won, and in other cases lost. The last 12 years of what people call war were not war. If we look at all the people killed and wounded over the last 
12 years, it averages out to 341 casualties a month. That's approximately 10 to 20 killed, perhaps, out of that 341. And don't misread me. I'm not dismissing or diminishing these losses by any stretch of imagination. I haven't even talked about the 3 trillion we lost in Iraq alone. What I'm talking about is that there's a profound difference between that and real war. In World War I, in 110 days of fighting, which is all we fought in World War I, we lost 318 men. 110,000 men were killed. Do the math. 110 days of fighting, 110,000 dead. From 6 June until 6 December 1944, we suffered 90,000 casualties a month. Now, the reason I bring this up is that that kind of lethality is waiting for us in the future. And we have been building forces designed to do everything other than fight and win those kinds of conflicts. We have transformed the Army and the Marine Corps into light constabulary forces designed to police unhappy Muslims suffering a, a hostile occupation by foreigners they don't like. We have created aircraft designed to drop laser-guided 500-pound small diameter bombs to kill one sheikh in northwest Pakistan that we've decided is a criminal. This is not preparation to fight and win wars. You can already begin to see the outlines. Jed Babin has pointed to some of it. We're not going to see any major war now, but Mr. Putin and many, many others on this globe are preparing very effectively. We need to do the same thing. We need to look at how we are organized to fight first and foremost, because the downward pressure in defense spending is not going to stop. No matter how hard some of the Republicans try, on the neocon end of the Republican Party to throw more money at the industrial age dinosaur we call the armed forces, it's not going to happen. We're going to see defense spending continue to fall because the American people, first of all, want it to fall. That's important to keep in mind. And secondly, because of this crushing debt that hangs over us, it's going to force savings out of us. And everyone in this room certainly understands that long before we cut grandma's Social Security, Medicare, and Medicaid, which is the biggest single absorbing power of budget, we are going to harvest money from defense. Now the problem is, how do we harvest that money? And there are enormous numbers of people who just don't give a damn. And that's a problem. Because how we reduce this force and what we do with what remains over the next 10 years will determine whether or not we are actually capable of fighting and winning in the future. Let me give you a quick example. The Chief of Staff of the Army said, in October last year, that he could only deploy two brigades of ready combat troops, whatever those combat troops were. Only two brigades. Right now, in the Army, that represents six to 7,000 men on a good day, if you're one. Now, what's wrong with this picture? He had a budget of $125 million, 517,000 soldiers. $37 billion in that budget was earmarked for readiness. Out of 517,000 troops with $125 billion and $37 billion for readiness, he couldn't provide more than two brigades. By the way, the readiness earmarked in the Navy's budget was $38 billion. It was $37.5 in the Air Force. Neither the CNO nor the Chief of Staff of the Air Force made a similar comment. Ladies and gentlemen, our problems today have less to do with spending money than they do about how we are organized to fight and how we invest the money that we've got. Jed's talked a little bit about the F-35. We could go through a whole portfolio of various weapon systems, all designed in isolation from the Organization for Combat, designed in isolation from any conceptual underpinning for their use, because there is no body at the top of the United States government that commands and develops the armed forces. The President of the United States and the Secretary of Defense do not command the armed forces. They referee them. There is no national defense staff. There is no supporting general staff structure to support the national defense staff. There is no one on the national defense staff who is loyal, first and foremost, 
to the National Defense Staff, the President, and the Secretary of Defense. We have four completely independent sovereign states called the United States Army, the United States Air Force, the United States Navy, the United States Marine Corps, who spend all of their time fighting interdependence, fighting integration of capability across service lines, insisting on investments that guarantee their independence from each other. For them, Washington and the budget process is a zero-sum game. Money that comes out of the Army goes into their pockets. Money that comes out of their pockets goes No one is asking any hard questions about how we are investing our money. Just before I came up here, I received a, a, lengthy, a lengthy email from someone in the Air Force explaining to me that the B-2 bomber, and I'm sure you've seen the B-2 stealth bomber, that's popular figure now on television and so forth. He pointed out to me, he said, look, Doug, every hour that we operate that thing costs us over $169,000. For every hour of operation, we spend 34 hours with that thing in maintenance. It is extremely fragile. So much ice and a hard rain and the stealthy features of its skin are at risk. And by the way, stealthy note is not a cloaking device. Stealth simply delays the acquisition time. In other words, you're eventually going to be found and identified. So there's no, do not confuse this stealth claim with a cloaking device. And radars, air defenses around the world are dramatically advancing. We have not fought anyone, really, since Vietnam that has an air defense. The best air defenses that we faced were Serb air defenses during the Kosovo Air War. We never degraded their air defenses below 83%. We hit virtually nothing on the ground of significance in the Yugoslav army. It wasn't the Air Force's fault. They were up against a very canny foe. The technology was largely 1970s, but the Serbs were able to integrate that into their force structure. New commercial radars. They were able to finally capture the signature for the stealth aircraft. They were able to shoot it down. They almost shot two more down. Large numbers of aircraft were seriously damaged and were ditched over the Adriatic. But the Air Force said, we didn't lose any aircraft. Because you see, in the Air Force, the attitude is, this is aerospace power. We must never admit that we can't do everything. If we do, aerospace power is at risk. It's not just the Air Force, that's everybody. The Navy, the Marines, the Army are all telling you, we can do everything everywhere all the time. We can't. We can't afford it. It's impossible. The pursuit of global military hegemony is bankrupting, it's unaffordable, it's unnecessary. We have got to scale this back so that we can achieve full spectrum dominance when and where we need it. That we can do. And we also need to do something else. Our great Achilles heel was mentioned earlier by Jay. It's called Command, Control, Communications, Computers, Intelligence, Surveillance, and Reconnaissance because most of it is space-based. And that capability is first in line to be lost in any major conflict. Now, we don't have to be without it. We can rapidly restore it. But we've got to move into other cheaper, faster alternatives. That includes high-altitude airships that can rapidly restore your satellite communications and your surveillance and reconnaissance capabilities. We cannot afford a separate system, a separate C4S on our system in every service. We cannot afford not to leverage what exists in the Air Force or exists in the Navy and apply it in the Army and the Marines. We can't afford to have the Marine Corps, 180,000 men, provide only 26,000 Marines in its infantry regiments. That is a very bad trade-off in terms of money. Right now, the United States Army has less than 23% of its 517,000 men in its supposedly deployable fighting units. 23%. The Japanese army, which is considerably smaller, has more than 40%. The numbers, the numbers are staggering when you look at the overhead. Quick example, in the United States Army, we have 4,773 colonels and generals, of course, of a little over 500,000. That's, on average, one colonel or general for every 108 soldiers one general for roughly every 300 soldiers. If you go to the Japanese army, which by the way is excellent, 
as is the Japanese Navy, and I would tell you that the Japanese Army and Navy, if they were set, set to task, would go through the Chinese as though they're not even there. And I've seen the Chinese. 229 colonels and generals in a force of 160,000. Only 7% in the overhead. With the Army, 21% of its officers and soldiers are in the overhead. Headquarters overhead. Three and four star single service headquarters. Look, if you go all the way back to World War II and you look at the contest that we, which really decided the war on the Eastern Front, because of Hitler's insistence and his stupidity, fortunately, he insisted that the Air Force, the Army, even Navy had separate headquarters and he would kludge these headquarters together for every major operation. He refused to appoint a theater commander. He refused to command, create a theater structure. The Soviets did the opposite. They created one unified military command structure in the East that ran from the lowest level to the highest. There was always one man in command of everything and all those assets. When Eisenhower took nine months to negotiate with the United States Air Force about where we would bomb before we landed in Normandy, the Soviets had a system that allowed a Soviet marshal within 15 minutes to do what Eisenhower took nine months to get. That's why they won that war. We have to move to a different and without unity of command, there is no unity of effort. We can't afford these redundancies. We will go bankrupt if we keep it up. If we do these things now, over the next 10 years, we have an excellent chance of staying well ahead of the rest of the world. And if we do have to fight, we will win. But if we continue to drag this Cold War dinosaur into the future, this single service solution to everything, this unconstrained spending for redundant capabilities, we will lose the war that counts, that decides the future of this republic. So, thank you very much. The floor is yours, and please make your presentation. Thank you very much for the introduction, the two introductions, and I'm very pleased to be here with you. Thank you for coming. Um, I'd like to make one general uh, remark about geostrategy, and then I'll focus on the field of my interest, the field of my research, which is the Middle East, and try to apply this. Uh, with regard to the region, with regard to U.S. policy in this region. The remark is about how I see the new wars versus the past wars, and I would call them conflicts because conflicts include wars and includes also preparation for that war to be won. The kinetic side is only one uh, dimension. And I tried to illustrate this in regard to the American understanding of the foes and the threats which is the title of, of this conference. I call it the, drop, the theory of the drop of water. If you have a drop of water falling on our head, it's not just a drop of water. You have, you have to look at the origin of this drop of water. If it's coming from a glass of water next to you, it's one thing. If it's one of thousands and millions of drops that are gonna come from that dark cloud, it's something else. Unfortunately, in our elite thinking over the past few years, you have not been, especially in the media, been able to connect between the single small acts of war, should they be terror or should they be limited movements that we see in the Middle East and elsewhere, with what is coming later. So what we have lost, I think, over the past more than a decade, maybe since the Cold War, is our ability, which was precise and very high during the Cold War, and even more in World War II and before, in not just predicting, but projecting where the threat is coming from. Uh, in Homeland Security, we often hear analysts saying, well, Major Hassan was a unique case, Major Hassan of Fort Hood, who killed 13 American military and, and citizens. And then we take another case and we say, well, that's a drop of water, and that's a drop of water. And if you look backward, you see, well, we have not had an attack of the size of 9-11. That's not the right way to look at these attacks. Because these attacks basically, even if they fail, are attacks. And when I look at the actual
actual nature of the cell, all those jihadists, all those individuals. What I'm interested in is not the actual case. It's what produces that case. What is the ideology, as we were invited to make a comment about. So if there is a factory that is producing those cases, it's like rain. In the beginning, you get hit with few drops of rain, then more, then more. And when the factory is in full steam, this is where we engage big time. Now, the difference between our wars today and before is that the conflict began before the massing of troops. When the massing of troops or the missiles are ready or the forces are ready, it's too late. And the other difference in this conflict with the jihadists, let's say, or other networks, is that they understand and they can predict our moves. They've seen us in several wars. You know in the beginning we are late, World War I, World War II, all wars, 9-11, and then we will mobilize and start striking. So the new strategy of the foes we are facing today is to mollify us gradually and strengthen themselves gradually. If we don't understand this equation, we cannot find ourselves in a situation, for example, in the homeland with dozens, not just few, maybe hundreds of cells to strike in a coordinated manner in the future. In the region, if you don't understand this equation, despite the interim nuclear deal, which is very simplistic, oversimplistic, we're going to find ourselves with an Iranian regime that has a fleet of missiles, and those missiles are deployed in more than one country. And the nuclear device is only the last thing they're going to deploy and the last thing they're going to produce. So from this perspective, let me just narrow to the field of my interest. I know I could make some remarks about Russia and China, but I prefer to focus on the greater Middle East. What I would like to argue in my few remarks is that since 9-11, and specifically over the past five to six years, we as the United States have had the strategic opportunity to win both in ethic and in world ideas, and that we have failed. And that with the direction we're taking right now, the projection is that we're gonna fail further unless Washington conducts a massive change of policy. That would be the summary of, of my remarks, and of course, on the, you know, in the book uh, that, that I'll be very happy to sign outside when we finish. Let me go back to a quick historical overview that would be very quick, although it's historical. In the post-Cold War era, um, in that region that we call the Greater Middle East, we, most of us, at least the observers, qualified observers, saw two things happening. One is that the foe was growing at a rapid pace than under the Cold War. Under the Cold War, Soviets, Communist bloc, that was the threat, it's understandable. The collapse of the Soviet Union and until the resurgence now of the new uh, leadership in Russia, there was this window before 9-11 whereby we saw that on the one hand you had the rise of what was called then Al-Qaeda, I would call them the Salafi Jihadists, Al-Qaeda is just one name of one generation, and the slow gradual move by the Iranian leadership to expand in the region. And we saw in the 90s, for example, that the Iranian regime had coordinated with the Syrian regime, they had penetrated Lebanon, they had established Hezbollah, they have began their joint action to establish in opposition to Saddam Hussein. If we haven't read that, then we couldn't have explained the events of post-2003. Most of it has happened on in Tanya. That was another fact that happened. Around the region, there were spots where civil society, first the minorities, ethnic and religious minorities, we're rising. We're trying to send us messages. Southern Sudan has been a phenomenon in the 1990s. Uh, 1.2 million African people had been killed. It was a genocide by a jihadi regime of uh, Omar al-Bashir in, uh, in, in Khartoum. Uh, Lebanon was occupied by Syria and, and struggling. Uh, the Syrian regime was suppressing its people. Saddam was gassing the Kurd and suppressing many in Iran. Uh, Iran has already uh, been very suppressive against its own population. So that struggle was not unknown, at least to those who were observing the Middle East. We had two tracks. On the one hand, the jihadists were expanding, 
Ben Laden's first declaration of war, second declaration of war in 1998, which was on Al Jazeera for 29 minutes, and I was very surprised of our reaction then. The United States did not actually react. Uh, I imagine that uh, the president then will go to Congress and say, we are at war, because there was a declaration of war against us, and they served us a notice in August of uh, the same year by attacking two of our embassies. Nothing happened. Our academic elite at the time, sometimes, uh, uh, you know, uh, through media such as the New York Times, argued that uh, at the time, Bin Laden was a Saudi dissident. No, he was not a Saudi dissident. He was the leader of a jihadist movement. He was not concerned about reforming Saudi Arabia, allowing women to drive. He was concerned about seizing as many countries, bringing them under international Taliban order, and engaging us in a strategic level. 9-11 occurred to shake off the slow progress by both the jihadists and the Iranian regime. As a result of 9-11, without going into the fray of, you know, assessing Iraq or Afghanistan, Afghanistan was a direct reaction, strategic reaction, to remove the, the Taliban who protected Al-Qaeda. Iraq was a war of choice, that's true, and historians and many among us here are going to discuss that. My interest was that the United States, by its actions, in the post 9 11 era, it did two things that would have consequence on what will become the Arab Spring. And I established this in my previous book. We opened two spaces. Now we can argue that maybe we should have not, or maybe we should have done more, and maybe these were the wrong spaces to open. Open to debate and discussion, but that's what we've done. We brought down the Taliban, we brought down Saddam Hussein. Now, the military experts will argue, I think, that in both places we defeated the actual goal of enemy and we established a status quo. I mean, the Taliban were not able to bring back their forces. We maintained that status quo. And Saddam Hussein's forces did not come back, although we were harassed for many years by Al Qaeda. I'll leave it to the military experts. I will look at the other uh, dimension. In both countries, we brought down one totalitarian regime. Each territory in Taliban in the past of Saddam Hussein. And the challenge was with what and whom we're going to replace those regimes. That was the challenge. It was not just that we can defeat the Taliban, obviously we, we can and we did. Of course, Saddam Hussein, of course we can and we did. And I understood from uh, the military experts that we could have done it even with a much smaller size, but I'm not the judge on this issue. So when we opened those two spaces, we actually without even planning, we have created and we have generated a chain of events which eventually is going to lead, lead to and it led to another opportunity which was called the Arab Spring, which we have failed to encounter again. So, many of my uh, colleagues have mentioned the fact that we have, in addition to those two spots, spent money on media on what we call, technically in government, strategic communications. Strategic communications means all the efforts and money that we spend on Voice of America, on al Hurra, on all the broadcasts that we are funding, by the way, on the engagement with the head of tribes, on the good stuff that the State Department does, such as producing DVDs to say how beautiful America is. The whole package is called strategic communications. And strategic communications, basically, is not just to neutralize the enemy or collect friends. Strategic communication should have been to allow friendly forces in those two spots and across the region to shift ideology. That's what the panel has been trying to discuss. When we do two wars, the result is not just to win those wars, but it's to open the opportunity for friendly forces. And we've heard many calls about where are the moderate Muslims, where are the moderate Arabs. I'll tackle that either now or in, in the question and answers. We had the opportunity is what I've uh, argued. Unfortunately, we lost it. While the military were doing their job, maintaining those two status quo places and being hit by a immense propaganda coming from the Iranian network, coming from the Muslim Brotherhood network. You recall the days of Al Jazeera, the days of massive movements to render illegitimate what we're doing in Iraq and illegitimate what we're doing in Afghanistan. This is a war. This is a war of ideas. This is not simply people angry at us. There is no such thing in the Middle East as people angry. There are networks who work, and those networks can control that anger and release that anger. 
and we've seen it very clearly now throughout the Arab Spring. So under the Bush administration, while the narrative at the top, and many among you maybe have been part of that narrative, was good in going in the right direction, meaning pushing for freedom, allowing freedom-loving forces to come forward, I can testify that most of the bureaucracies under the Bush administration who were in charge of the war of ideas did not deliver. Did not deliver on purpose, did not deliver because of ignorance. I do charge and argue in my book that some of the, this failure came as a result of actions in a war of ideas by two lobbies, by two pressure groups. pressure group has been sympathized with the Iranian regime and the goal of it was very simple. It was to convince the American public. It was to deter the American government, both in Congress and the administration, not to continue the work against the Iranian regime, not to support the opposition against the Iranian regime. The uh, slogans of, if you support the Iranian opposition, this is a piece of death to the Iranian opposition. Who produced that? Well, the Iranian regime. They convinced us. They convinced the high decision makers that the Iranian public will come with the Iranian regime if we uh, do any action against it. And the action is not just about military action. We will see in 2009 when this doctrine came to effect and when there were two million Iranians on the streets of Tehran that this idea, this notion, pushed by the pro-Iranian lobby, convincing many decision makers, including at the highest top in the second, the following administration, that we failed to help flipping Iran. So, the second network that also has been very active under the bureaucracies, the previous bureaucracies of the Bush administration, were the Muslim Brotherhood. I am not inventing it today, and I'm happy that we're speaking a couple of weeks after a statement came from the Middle East. How many among us, how many in Washington have been trying to warn Congress, to warn the administration about the influence that this pressure group or lobby has and had in, uh, in, in the United States and in the West, and they were treated of what? They were treated of Islamophobe. If you criticize the jihadi ideology, if you criticize the Muslim Brotherhood, you automatically are declared as an Islamophobe. Well, guess what? The Saudis, you like them or not, the UAE, Bahrain, Jordan, and Egypt jointly have declared the Muslim Brotherhood as a terrorist organization. And moreover, last week, this coalition of new countries that are coming together against the Brotherhood and to contain Iran have revealed that petrodollars have been invested in America over the past three decades to enable the Muslim Brotherhood to block policies by the United States and the region. So here you have it. We were not dreaming. We were not fantasizing. It was true. Under the Obama administration, what, what was a bureaucracy not willing to carry out the policies of, of, of the Bush administration became one with the administration. So now, since 2009, we don't even have an opposition of ideas. You have the Obama administration, the Obama democracy, uh, bureaucracy, and of course, you have the still very strong two lobbies pushing in the same direction. So here are the signs of what came as an Arab Spring later on the situation today. In June of 2009, there were two events that told us that the direction of the administration were to apologize for what the United States, quote unquote, has done, meaning full withdrawal from the region on the one hand, and to me what is more dangerous than the withdrawal, because withdrawal, you could decide for your own interest. You are on retreat or not on retreat. But what is dangerous is that you have a misperception about your partners. So in 2009, there was a speech delivered at Cairo University. And in that speech, if you read the speech, you would understand that it is aimed at a Muslim Brotherhood alternative to the regimes who are sitting there. And there was a letter issued by the White House, by the President, to the Grand Ayatollah of the Islamic Republic of Iran, in which there was a delay for engagement. Now, those two events, were strategic events because it showed that for the next five to six years this is policy has been the policy. Immediately after that letter was issued in early June, there was a massive demonstration in Iran. And that demonstration was very close in my own assessment and I would accept the counter argument, but very close from shaking off the foundation 
of the Ayatollahs and the Mullahs. They have never seen anything like that. 60% of the of the demonstrators were under the age of 20. And if you are the regime, you understand what that means. Under the age of 20, that means the future of Iran. 20% of those under 20, these are approximate uh, assessment, were girls in Iran. We know of one symbolic case of uh, Neda who was killed. She was one of these uh, many hundreds of thousands of girls and women who, who contributed. What was our reaction to this? Quote, we don't want to be seen as meddling in Iranian internal affairs, as if this was taken from academia, as this was taken from our Middle Eastern studies. Well, when the administration makes such a statement, it would be read by the Iranian regime as, go ahead. We're not going to side with the demonstrators. You can go ahead and, and finish them off. And what we're interested in, according to what we saw now a few, few months ago, is an interim deal with you. We want to have a partnership. So, my point is that nothing surprised me of our US policy during the Arab Spring because there were two tracks. One is to partner with the Muslim Brotherhood, even before the Arab Spring. And one is to find and cut a deal with the Iranian regime. These are the two arms of our foreign policy in, in the Middle East. What we did not expect, I assume, was that civil societies, and I know many of my colleagues in the beginning of the Arab Spring disagreed with my view, but I'm not come back now and reinforce that. I do argue that the so-called Arab Spring had three layers, quick layers. One was civil societies, youth in the region, women and minorities, labor and middle class had enough of suppression, all kind of suppression. The regimes that we like, you know, many among us on TV, they would say, well, we should have been, you know, uh, in solidarity with Mubarak. Yeah, Mubarak served our interests, but at one point, his own society would rise. What do you want us to do? The most important thing to do is not to replace Mubarak, who's worse than Mubarak. You, we don't want to do the battle for Mubarak. That's for the Egyptians to decide. Same thing in Tunisia, same thing in Libya. So here we are. When the Arab Spring exploded in the beginning, the thin layer of truly civil society is rising, disorganized, no connection with us. Many of my panelists, colleagues are asking us, where are the martyrs? Well, these are the martyrs. They were the martyrs. They rose. What did we do? We connected with the second layer, with the Muslim Brotherhood in Tahrir Square. And I argued in my book, and I got a lot of criticism from, from friends of the administration, that we only asked Mubarak to step down when we were sure that the Brotherhood were in Tahrir Square. If you go back to your archives, this is, this is the biggest of all issues. We did not even connect with the civil society rising until the Brotherhood were in. That would tell you how closely partnership, uh, the partnership was uh, with, with that organization. Now, across North Africa, three regimes rose either partially as in Libya or in Tunisia and Egypt as Muslim Brotherhood, and we began that partnership. In Syria, we got blocked, I don't want to take too much time, because we didn't know what to choose, who to choose. That's the reality. On the one hand, we have an Assad regime, which is allied to Iran, and we want to have a deal with the Iranians, so we cannot fight a regime that is allied to a regime that we want to have a deal with, otherwise that deal will, won't work. That's in two words why we are not acting in Syria. On the other hand, uh, we have these Islamist forces who are claiming also for a participation. So we, we didn't have a partner to work with because the first six months of that, of that uprising in Syria, we missed to connect with the demonstrators, with the actual civil society. We didn't have in our bureaucracies, in our agencies, a partnership already established from before. So now, the Arab Spring exploded. First layer we missed, second layer takes over. A third layer which is now at play, and I am projecting, without our help, knowing that it would be extremely dangerous for them to be ruled by a brotherhood regime as in Egypt, or Nahda as in Tunisia, or the Salafi jihadi militias in, in Libya, on their own, these people understood that they would have to rise. And I am, uh, I am stunned that in the West, the mainstream media and mainstream academia is looking at what's happening in Egypt, for example, as a coup, only as a coup. Well, there was 33 million people. If 33 million people are a coup, we need to change political science. We need to change international relations. And I'm, I'm for that. But, we, you know, a coup is 200 tanks, taking radio, taking TV, 
becoming, establishing a Pinochet-like regime. That's a coup. But 33 million people engaged in a revolution against the Islamist regime that had a militia, which is Taliban-like militia going after them, calling on the army to help them against the regime is not a coup. Maybe it's a third species. We will have to determine that in the future. Now to my conclusion. The trends now in the region under our policy is that the jihadists are expanding. You know, we killed Bin Laden, we killed Anwar al-Awlaki. These were the ancestors of Al-Qaeda. It's like in World War II, killing the, the generals of the Germans of World War I. No, we are in World War II. Things have changed. Al-Qaeda is in more countries than ever before. Back to the Sunni Triangle of Iraq. Expanding in Syria, in Yemen, in Somalia, across what I call planet Sahel of Africa, five, six countries. Fighting in Sinai and along the Nile, in Benghazi, Burma, and Barba. And I don't want to even mention the cells growing in Western Europe. And so the jihadists are growing. Now, should we have a policy to contain that growth? Yes, I hope in the debate we're going to discuss that. The Iranian regime, I think they fooled us. I'm using a term which is not political science, but that's the best term I could find. They outmaneuvered us. Because in this interim deal, they got number one, that we are lifting the sanctions. Number two, that we are encouraging business to go and business is going to Tehran. And that financial rescue to the Iranians, which we have added to another billion dollars, up to 20 probably by the end of the uh, agreement, from Iranian frozen money, is going to inf you know, insert so much cash, not in Iranian economy, but in the Iranian regime economy, and there's a big difference, political scientists and economists understand that, that there's a difference between the Iranian citizen economy and the Paisdaran, Iran Revolution Guard, and the Mullah's economy that would allow them to survive. The Iranians, meanwhile, have probably lowered, as we argued last night, the production of uranium, because that production could go up to 20, down to 10, down to 5, and up to 35 anytime you want. What they have not done is to actually take a decision that we are not going to forego of nuclear weapons, as South Africa has done, as Ukraine has done. If you tell me the Iranians have declared that we don't want nuclear weapons, come and help us to get rid of them, then that would be the reason for a nuclear neutral deal. They have said, oh, we agree for six months, we're going to lower that production. What are they doing ne next door? They are increasing their fleet of missiles. Why would you have hundreds and thousands of missiles? It's not to, to carry a hand grenade, it's to carry a much bigger thing. Why the Iranians are in control of Iraq, are fighting in Syria, are with Hezbollah in Lebanon, are now threatening Bahrain, Eastern Arabia, fighting in Northern Yemen, have facilities in Eritrea, ports, and are now established in Port Sudan. Any geostrategic thinker would understand what the Iranians are doing. The Iranian re uh, regime is doing everything a dome, uh, creating a dome before producing and deploying the bomb. They're very smart. If they deploy the bomb first, it will be taken out. So they create all the defenses of that nuclear weapon and then they may surprise us. Last, civil societies. I am confident with some hesitation that civil societies are on board to move forward. What I'm not confident about is that we are ready to meet them. And I don't think that at this point in time, our administration, not sure about this Congress or the next Congress, but I'm, I, I am clear that this administration has not made yet the decision to work with civil societies, find those allies, identify them, enable them, empower them, so that there would be the alternative to uh, the regimes that are totalitarians and the terrorists. With all of this, you're going to find a lot of consequences, which I'm not going to cover, but what's happening in Crimea and Ukraine as a decision by the Russians to move forward, and probably the Chinese will move on some islands or uh, some other spots. The North Pole is waiting for many. The Antarctica is waiting for many. All of this because we showed that in the Middle East, we are not going in the direction that they that put the term. We showed in Syria, we showed in Iran, Thank you very much. It is not coincidental that the Iranians invented the game of chess.
chess. But thank you very much, sir. Uh, our cleanup bill, the redoubtable, the remarkable, Norman Potthorns.
There the Soviet communist threat was certainly acknowledged, but containment was regarded as too timid a strategy to counter it. Richard Nixon, Dwight Eisenhower's running mate in 1952 against Adlai Stevenson, who was Truman's handpicked successor, Nixon mocked Stevenson as a graduate of the cowardly college of communist containment, while, while John Foster Dulles, Eisenhower's future secretary of state, repeatedly called for a policy aimed not at holding the line against any further Soviet expansion, but rather at liberating the countries which were already living under communist regimes installed and controlled by Soviet arms. Yet, when Eisenhower came into office, he quietly shelled these campaign promises as too dangerous to keep. And for all practical purposes, though, without admitting it, he not only adopted containment as his own, but if anything, applied it less boldly than Truman had. The question I raised in my book was whether the Democrats, if they were to win the presidency in 2008, would do unto the Bush doctrine what the Republicans had done unto the Truman doctrine in 1952. Uh, here's how I put it in the book. I love quoting myself. <laughs> and this is a long one. It goes with this way. If in, I wrote this. If in January 2009, a Democrat should be sworn in as President of the United States, will he or she, as reality in the shape of Hillary Clinton rather than political correctness requires us to add, Will he or she, like Eisenhower with respect to the Truman Doctrine in 1952, tacitly acknowledge that there is no serious alternative to the, threat, to the strategy that the Bush Doctrine prescribes other than returning to the law enforcement approach through which we dealt so ineffectually with terrorism before 9-11, or submitting to the craven will of the Europeans and the corrupt administrations of the UN. Will he or she realize that no matter how such a shift might be dressed up and spun, it would and rightly be interpreted by our enemies as a cowardly retreat? Will he or she understand that the despotisms of the Middle East would then once again feel free to offer and launching pads to Islamo-fascist terrorists? Will he or she realize that these terrorists would be emboldened to attack us again and on an infinitely greater scale than before? And on the home front, will he or she cease and desist from raising false alarms about the threat to civil liberties posed by programs essential to protecting us from just such terrorist attacks, programs like the surveillance of certain international phone calls? Will he or she stop defining torture down to the point where it becomes impossible to, to, to conduct any interrogation at all of captured terrorists, thereby depriving us of the, of the intelligence that is also necessary if further attacks are to be prevented? Well, from the way the Democrats have been acting and speaking, I'm still quoting that passage from my book. From the way the Democrats have been acting and speaking, especially since Bush's re-election in 2004, all of the answers would seem to be no. But is it too much to hope that these denials of reality are only the luxurious indulgences of opposition and that a Democratic president like Eisenhower in 1952 will be forced by the awesome responsibilities of power to forego them all and to take up where Bush will have left off. That's the end of the quote. Well, a Democrat did become president in January 2009, and what seemed to be the answers to my questions during the campaign turned out to be the same resounding no's and then some once he took power. And so, here we are, nearly 14 years after we were attacked on our own soil, something it's useful to remember that neither Hitler nor Stalin ever managed to do. Here we are, still threatened by an enemy whose name we dare not speak and without a strategy to tell us how and where to take him on. Or, to 
put the case more precisely, we have a strategy that tells us how and where not to take him on, or anyone else for that matter. Like his forefathers on the left, who blamed the outbreak of the, war, of the Cold War on us rather than on the Soviet Union, and like his former pastor who described 9-11 as the chickens coming home to roost, Barack Obama blames the Muslim world's hostility to the United States on our alleged mistreatment of them, which is why one of his first acts as president was to go on what rightly became characterized as an apology tour and to deal henceforth entirely by diplomatic means with those nations or extranational forces like the Muslim Brotherhood, who, putting it mildly, made no secret of hating us. As for dealing with our allies, Obama would renounce the leadership role he had played since the end of World War II, and he would lead, if at all, only from behind, except, of course, for Israel. George W. Bush had declared that, and I quote, the United States will not support the establishment of a Palestinian state until its leaders engage in a sustained fight against the terrorists, close quote. Obama, in line with his general sympathy for the Muslim Brotherhood, and in this case, very much leading from the front, threw American support behind Palestinian leaders who celebrated terrorists as heroes and martyrs. But just as he blames our policies for the Muslim world's hatred of us, so he blames Israel for the genocidal wish to wipe the Jewish state off the map that drives the Palestinians and their supporters in the world. Elsewhere, however, Obama hewed pretty consistently to the strategy of leading from behind. And yet, his implementation of it was soliciting, eliciting not the applause he must have expected, but responses ranging from the puzzlement of his admirers to the disgust of his critics. Especially in the aftermath of his failure to make good on his repeated threats to use force against Assad, even members of his own party began despairingly echoing in private the public denunciations of him as incompetent, feckless, amateurish, and in over his head, coming from his political opponents on the right. Summing up the situation at that moment, as, as astute a foreign observer as Conrad Black could flatly say, and I quote, not since the, descent, in, the, the disintegration of the Soviet Union in 1991, and before that the fall of France in 1940, has there been so swift an erosion of the world influence of a great power as we are witnessing with the United States. Yet, if this is indeed the past to which Obama has led us, and I think it is, let me suggest that it signifies not how incompetent and amateurish this president is, but how skillful. Which is to say that his foreign policy, far from a dismal failure, is a brilliant success as measured by what he intended all along to accomplish. The accomplishment would not have been possible if the intention had been too obvious, and the skill lies in how effectively he has used rhetorical tricks to disguise it. The key to understanding what Obama has pulled off is the astonishing statement he made in the week before being elected president. We are five days away from fundamentally transforming the United States of America. Now to those of us who took this declaration seriously, it meant that Obama really was the left-wing radical he seemed to be, given his associations with the likes of the viciously anti-American preacher Jeremiah Wright and the unrepentant terrorist Bill Ayers, not to mention the intellectual influence over him of Saul Alinsky, the original community organizer whose rules for radicals would in more than one instance serve as a kind of playbook for Obama in pursuing his promised goal. Now, so far as domestic affairs were concerned, it soon became clear, even to some of those who persuaded themselves that Obama was a moderate and a pragmatist, 
But the fundamental transformation he had in mind was to turn this country into as close a replica of the social democratic countries of, of Europe as the constraints of our political system allowed. Since he had enough support for the policies that this objective entailed, those constraints were fairly loose. Therefore, he only needed a minimum of rhetorical deception in pursuing it. All it took was to follow the Alinsky playbook, which meant denying that he was doing what he was doing. By singing the praises of the free enterprise system, he was assiduously working to undermine by avoiding the word socialism, by invoking the fairness as an overriding ideal, and by playing on resentment of the rich. But foreign policy was another matter. True to the leftist political culture that had formed him, Obama believed that at least since 1945, the United States had been a retrograde and destructive force in world affairs. Accordingly, the fundamental transformation he wished to achieve here was to reduce the country's malignant power and influence. And just as he had to fend off the still toxic socialist label at home, so he had to take care not to be stuck with the equally toxic isolationist label abroad. This he did, again, in good Alinsky fashion, by camouflaging his retreats from the responsibilities bred by foreign entanglements as a new form of engagement. At the same time, he relied on the war weariness of the American people and the rise of isolationist sentiment, which for the moment dare not speak its name, both on the left and the right, to get away with snatching defeat from the jaws of victory in Iraq, with, for all practical purposes, throwing the fight in Afghanistan, and with planning for cuts in the defense budget so drastic that they amounted to a form of unilateral disarmament. The consequent seepage of American power was going very nicely when the unfortunately named Arab Spring presented Obama with several juicy opportunities to speed up the process. First, in Egypt, his seemingly incoherent maneuvers resulted in the replacement of a pro-American regime with an anti-American one in the shape of the Muslim Brotherhood. Then in Syria, a similar set of seemingly incoherent moves ended with the leading American position in the Middle East ceded to another enemy in the shape of Vladimir Putin's Russia. Meanwhile, though still insisting that he would never allow the Iranian mullahs to develop a nuclear weapon, he was inching his way through a farcical charade of negotiations to letting them develop it. It all added up greater diminution of American power than he probably envisaged, even in his wildest radical dreams. For this fulfillment of his dearest political wishes, Obama is evidently willing to suffer a sullied reputation as weak and or incompetent. In that sense, I would guess that he is, by his own lights, sacrificing himself for what he imagines is the good of the nation of which he is the president and also for the benefit of the world of which he loves proclaiming himself a citizen. If the benefit is delayed by unfortunate consequences like the non-stop slaughter in Syria and the Russian seizure in Crimea, Crimea, well, it's a price worth paying for cutting the United States down to size and thereby eliminating the root cause of just about every political, social, and economic wrong in the world. The problem for Obama is that Americans have taken pride in being number one since the end of World War II. Unless then the American people have been as fundamentally transformed as their country is quickly becoming, America's decline will not sit well with them. With more than three years in office to go, will Obama be willing and able to endure the further erosion of his popularity that has already set in? and that will almost certainly decline even more steeply in tandem with the continuing erosion of the country's power and influence. No doubt he will either deny that anything has gone wrong or failing that he will resort to his favorite tactic of blaming others, Congress or the Republicans or Rush Limbaugh. But what is also almost certain is that he will refuse to change course 
and to start doing the things that are necessary to restore the power and influence in the United States. Since, to say again what cannot be said too often, he believes that the root cause of virtually every evil in the world is precisely the power of the United States, and since he probably considers the diminution of that power that he has fostered to be his proudest achievement in foreign affairs, why on earth would he wish to restore it? In this, he differs from Jimmy Carter, to whom he otherwise bears uh, eerie political res uh, resemblance. Now, little did I ever dream that I would hold up the egregious Jimmy Carter as a model. But the fact is, but the fact is that after the Soviet invasion of Afghanistan in 1979, Carter admitted that he had been wrong in believing that we as a nation had suffered from what he called an inordinate fear of communism, and that we and the Soviets shared what the Secretary of State once said, shared the same dreams and aspirations. <laughs> Consequently, Carter executed a 180-degree turn and set into motion the beefing up of our defenses upon which Ronald Reagan was able to build. The upshot is that the hole Obama will go on digging will be even deeper than the one Carter left for Reagan. And so we can only pray that our next president will be as determined as Reagan was to dig us out, and that the hole will not by then be too deep for him to succeed, as Reagan himself did when he followed Jimmy Carter.
Uh, so many friends in the audience, and I'm obviously going to overlook people, but my dear friend Al King, who was the Secretary of the Cabinet in the Reagan administration, former ambassador, was here. Uh, Katie McFarland, who many of you watch on uh, Fox News, is here, and my favorite uh, columnist in the New York Post, Roy Murdoch, is here. So uh, if I overlook friends, please forgive me. But thank you, man. America's greatest actor, Tony LeBianco, is here in the first row. But thank you very much. I want to give members of the panel an opportunity to ask one another questions. And we'll do that very briefly because I have an interest in hearing from those of you in the audience. Uh, on my way to the men's room, I heard quite a few comments, some interesting comments. So I want to give everyone in this audience an opportunity to express himself, although this will not be a time for you to deliver a speech to ask a question. First, are there questions that you would like to ask one another? Doug, Chad, Norman. I always no. try. To, I always try to ask Doug why the heck he thinks there's no threats out there when we have people like Iran and China in the office. I mean, it's a dangerous, dangerous world. It may be that you're right that we won't have a war in the next couple of years, but I think we are agreed that we have to prepare for what's coming, and there is a lot of danger out there. Oh, dear. Now you know when I woke up this morning, I immediately went to my cell phone and I checked my daily horoscope and said, <laughs> Douglas, you are not going to convince Jen Babbitt that you should not bomb <laughs> your mom. True. So, uh, let me say a couple of things in, in a general sense. First of all, I am someone who agrees with this part. Preventive war is analogous to committing suicide I don't, support, I, don't I, I don't support it. I think it's a mistake. If you go back over the 20th century, with the exception of 1991's Desert Storm, every single war began with the assumption at high levels, military and political, that the war would be short, that the operations would be coherent, and they would accomplish something positive. They were all wrong. War is entirely unpredictable. It sets in motion forces that you simply cannot control. No one ever goes through the purpose, method, and state analysis. What's the purpose? What are we trying to achieve? How are we going to do it? And what do we want it to look like when it's over? Nobody does it. We say, oh, we want to defeat them, and off we go. And everything turns out differently from what we anticipated. Doesn't matter, Vietnam, intervention in Panama, uh, Desert Storm, Iraq, in 2003, uh, everywhere we've gone, and we're not alone. Germans in World War II, invasion of the Soviet Union, on and on and on. So as a general principle, I oppose unilateral action uh, that is not provoked by a direct attack on the United States or its interests. So that's number one. Number two, when it comes to Iran, I don't share the, the popular view that you've heard. I think Iran is not uh, evil incarnate. I think, in fact, <laughs> the Khomeinist regime is reached entropy. I think that revolution has reached a, a, an end point. I think the body of the population, particularly in the urban areas, wants very much a different life, a different approach. There is overwhelming support in that population that's educated and thoughtful to do business with the West. There's no interest in fighting Jews or Israel or anything else. They don't give a damn about the Palestinians or Arabs in general. And the regime in Tehran is, I think, going to last a little while longer, but I don't think it's going to last too much longer. And I think things will change. If we attack Iran, let's go through the, the likely scenario. First of all, to attack them with conventional weapons will not destroy their current Iran uranium enrichment process. You can disrupt it. Uh, some people think you can delay it, but you're not going to destroy it. The only way to destroy it with any certainty at all is with the use of a nuclear weapon. I see no evidence that we, or the Israelis, will unilaterally launch a nuclear strike on Iran. Secondly, if you launch uh, conventional strikes against Iran, you will be at war with Iran. And all of the people who would otherwise like to do business with you and would like to see change in that country will immediately fall into line behind a regime that we all detest. 
they will fight to the last Iranian, and they will use their agents and friends wherever they can find them, and they will become the victim, the international victim that will receive aid, support, and assistance from very interesting places. I would argue everywhere from France to Beijing. They will end up with the technology that they have been unable to achieve on their own far more quickly. And then finally, someone will say, to end this, we must go in on the ground. We will have to commit ground forces. And if we commit ground forces, we can get into Iran from the Indian Ocean. We will be able to go into the south. The air defense networks down there are not particularly well integrated. We can penetrate them. We can bring forces ashore. And then as we move north towards Tehran and the body of the population, the Russians will put 250,000 troops into northern Iran at the request of the Iranians. And we will be in a position very similar to what we were in in Korea, with the exception that we will have no one supporting us, no one helping us, no one assisting us, because you know India and Iran are very close, as India, Russia, and Iran are very close. And the Sunni Islamists, who you may think are cheering you on, are not going to bend over backwards to help us. So we will be very much on our own. We will ultimately have to withdraw because we will not be able to guarantee the support structure ashore and we will embarrass ourselves. So the bottom line is, if you sit down and you work your way through this purpose, method, end state from a purely military standpoint right now, no one, no one in the military is going to tell you to do it. They're going to tell you not to do it. Well, I, I'd like to take that up. Let me play with that a little bit. <laughs> Sorry about <laughs> that. Uh, Norman, yeah, please. This is something we talk about all the time. We have a very grave agreement, a very grave disagreement about it, because there are certain risks that we cannot tolerate. I disagree with Doug. We cannot wait for a unilateral attack by Iran against us, number one, because this country would be ineradicably changed, inalterably changed by any nuclear explosion within the United States. If we have a nuclear attack on Israel, Israel is done as a nation. It will be annihilated. It will no longer exist. There are certain risks that we can't take. And yes, war is something that you can't totally predict when you go in. There is no reason for us to do more than to delay the nuclear weapons program. And that's plenty good enough because if Iran has so many people that they tell us all the time are ready to go and revolt against the regime and are ready to, if, if that's true, and I don't really think it is, but even if it's true, those people will be able to replace the regime if we go in and take away their nuclear weapons, even for a time, which is plenty good enough. So in this one case, I kept saying earlier that when you have a vital national security interest, it's the only time you go to war. This is one of those cases and I would advocate that we or the Israelis or both go do it. And the longer we wait, the harder it's going to be. Sorry. Yeah, uh, yeah. Uh, Colonel McGregor has uh, adopted the tactic of the worst case scenario as an excuse for doing nothing. Uh, it's a familiar tactic. I, uh, I want to present another scenario. It's often said that um, one of the reasons we have to stop Iran from getting the bomb is that it will trigger a nuclear arms race in the uh, Middle East. Uh, everybody else there will try to get a bomb, and uh, this increases the chances uh, exponentially of a, either an accidental or a deliberate uh, nuclear explosion somewhere. Now, my view is that uh, I would, uh, I wish we would have enough time for a nuclear arms race in the Middle East if Iran gets the bomb. Just imagine that Iran, that Iran has the bomb, even if it doesn't admit it. Israeli intelligence knows that they, that they have the capability to strike. You would have a, a hair-trigger situation such as never has existed since the invention of nuclear weapons. Because the, Iran, the Israelis would be sitting there saying, do we preempt uh, or wait to retaliate out of the rubble? And the Iranians are asking themselves the same question. Uh, do we wait for the Israelis to hit us and then retaliate, or do we hit them first? <clears throat> Under those circumstances, one or the other is going to beat the other to the punch. And then all hell breaks loose, and not just between those two nations. 
My argument is, I think this is a perfectly realistic scenario, and my argument is that confronted with the consequences of such a situation, uh, all the horror stories <coughs> you can think of uh, to uh, prevent us from taking conventional action now look like, like chunk change. Uh, we're, we're faced with an alternative of an almost certain outbreak of nuclear war that would very likely spread beyond the initiating parties, uh, and a admittedly risky, dangerous, <coughs> uncertain military operation. Uh, and I want to say one more thing about the, uh, the Iranian populace. First of all, the Iranian populace has nothing to say about these decisions. Uh, secondly, uh, if the Iranian populace is so anti-regime as we keep being told, uh, there's a possibility that it would rebel against the mullahs if there were an attack. Uh, I think that's almost as likely as that they would rally to the regime. But even if they did rally to the regime, I still think everything bad you can imagine from a conventional attack, uh, which uh, will only come from Israel now because Obama's not going to do it, uh, everything bad that could come from that is uh, nothing compared to what will happen against the bomb. We want to give uh, people in this audience an opportunity to speak, so, but please, I urge you, uh, do not deliver long-winded speeches and ask a question. And if you can, please identify yourself when you ask that question. One other point that I wanted to make, a couple of people asked me about this. The uh, London Center is sponsoring an event in the Senate on April 7th on the Muslim Brotherhood. Well, the Ferris, yours truly, Bud McFarlane, will be in a panel discussing the Muslim Brotherhood. If you can be in Washington on this occasion, please let us know. We would love to have you join us. And now, your question. Yoram Yogerstar. Uh, let's wait for the microphone and ad ad identify yourself, please. Yoram Kinberg, ex JP Morgan Chase, currently YK Capital. Uh, two, two questions. One about Iran. Clearly, Obama, as well as Netanyahu, said that nuclear in Iran is unacceptable. The red line is somewhat different. So, and it's clearly the red line of Netanyahu is time to bomb, rather than good news or bad news, they have a bomb. Uh, so, what's your position on that? The other thing that we didn't talk as much, and that's my biggest personal concern after Iran, is cyber warfare. You mentioned 1,000 attacks a day. At what point we say it's as unacceptable as little missiles unacceptable in God coming from Gaza to Israel? I could see the risk of major cyber attack more realistic to the United States than actually nuclear attack by Iran. Ali, why don't you start? I'll start with a shot. Um, two quick remarks on the issue of Iran that was discussed by the panel and now the gentleman is raising it again. First one is a little bit sarcastic, which is this discussion about decision by the United States to strike against Iran, to act against the Iranian regime, is a good discussion before 2009 and after 2016. Because I do not believe, from what I know, what I have been engaged in discussions in Congress and beyond, that this administration has the philosophy and the logic that this regime is actually a foe, a strategic foe. The administration's theoricians and ideologues believe that the Iranian regime is where it is right now because of past wrong policies by the United States and other Cairo speech. So let's save our discussion uh, to, to what we can do as of 2016 if there is any different uh, administration. Two, regardless of that, it is very important in any discussion about the Iranian regime is to look at what is the Iranian plan. Because we often look at what is our plan, and we think that the Iranians are expected to do exactly how, the way we're gonna act. Well, the Iranian regime understand what the capacities of the United States are, and now they're very happy with the political decision that the administration has. But regardless, number one, the Iranians, as I've tried to argue from the microphone, the Iranian regime that is, know very well that if they produce and show the first bomb, there's going to be a lot of pressure in the international community. First, there's going to be an Israeli reaction. 
and the Israelis have a clock that is different from our clock. They will have to retaliate, even if they don't eliminate the system, they will have to retaliate because, as it was mentioned, one hit on Israel and the, the nation is, is paralyzed, it's gone. So, the Iranians know that. And the Iranians will not aim that bomb against the Israelis or any other enemy before they have their own, I use the term the Israelis use, dome. They don't want a second strike to take them out. I know many of my colleagues and I in the past and they have said, well, they are jihadists, they would love to go and meet Allah. That is not exactly what the leadership of Iran is. They want to stay here, they want to live, they want to recreate an empire and let the, you know, the, the grunt on the ground and the infantry die and meet, uh, meet their creator. So the Iranians have been doing this game. What they are trying to get is time, a lot of time, strategic time. They're buying it with all, by all means. Why would I need that time? So that when they are ready to become and act as a nuclear power, we don't have anymore the capacity of taking them out quickly. With air force, with submarines, it would become a very big problem. When they are not yet there. So, as I'm reading the map, first they're interested in continuing relentlessly in, very, in, a, in a very speedy manner to build their fleet of missiles those long-range missiles, because missiles can be equipped in about a month, two months, according to the experts. So, first they build the missiles, then they carry the bomb. Two, the anti-aircraft, anti-missile missiles. You see, the Iranians are always busy with this, with the Russians, with the Chinese, with the North Koreans, and the rest. Third, to have an Iran that is much wider in strategic scope than the actual nation state of Iran. Iranians would fight us in Iraq, in Syria, in Mount Lebanon with Hezbollah. As I said earlier, and I was focusing on this issue, they have now facilities in Eastern Sudan, in Port Sudan. They are in the Red Sea. Didn't the Israelis stop a ship coming from Iran to Gaza in the Red Sea? Yes, because they were exiting from uh, Port Sudan. So, once they would have this large area where they can retaliate against our calculations, and I will defer to military strategic thinkers, our calculation to strike Iran while Iran has basis to launch against us or basis to act terrorist in a terrorist manner against us is much wider, it will change our calculation. The Iranians are smart, they have intelligence, so they're not static and staying. They're using the precious time that we are wasting to create conditions whereby the day they're going to produce one, maybe ten bombs, and equip them, and have them on launching pads, we may not have what we have now to deter them. That would be my point. Uh, one point that I would just like to add to that, if I may. Wally and I had a chance to chat about this last night, and I'm convinced that what emerges from the so-called deal that is presently engaged in these negotiations that we are engaged in with Iran is a deal not dissimilar from what we've seen in Japan. That is, the Iranians are given the ability to continue to enrich uranium. They will have enough bison material to build several bombs, but they will not build a bomb. They will just wait. With great fanfare, the President of the United States will say, you see, we have prevented Iran from developing the bomb. They have the Pfizer material, they have the missiles, they can weaponize those missiles, but they choose not to do so now, for the very reasons that Waldeen has pointed out. And as a consequence, this becomes a political victory for the president, and it appears, at least from the standpoint of the United Nations, that the Iranian government is acting in a responsible fashion. That's my guess. And I think there's probably some evidence, some empirical evidence, to support that claim. But Robert, I wanted to give you a chance to speak. Robert has been very instrumental in developing the narrative of this, uh, this conversation today. So now, Robert, the floor is yours. Use the microphone and please make your call. Thank you. Uh, there's been, well, part of the theme of the conference was the ideological dimension of warfare. And that's been brought up a couple of times. And there is some agreement that we're not doing all that we could do, put it mildly. Um, I want to Can you speak up a little, Robert, or maybe even stand because there are okay. people in the back that can't hear you. There was an expatriate from Iran who wrote this. No, he translated. He didn't write it. He translated this book into English from it was a book or pamphlet, but it was written by a um, lieutenant of Bin Laden, and he was not a military strategist. He was one of their ideological gurus who wants to make sure that the ideology is pure. I think the name that would fit is the future of the Iraqi Peninsula after the fall of Baghdad. And I can't remember the gentleman's name, but that's 
But he lists all these different potential threats to their vision of um, the caliphate, jihadism, whatever, you know, their, their vision of this ideal jihadi society has potential, you know, you've got, you've got Arab nationalism, you've got all these different threats, but more dangerous to their vision of Islam, and all these threats put together as American democracy, this, in quote, the seductive capacity of America. So these jihadi leaders recognize the, um, because you know, a lot of a lot of the Western educated Muslims in the 19th century were embracing these kind of ideals. Now <coughs> these Western educated Muslims are becoming jihadists. Something's wrong. So we've been falling down on this war of ideas for quite some time now, and I want to get some feedback into this is something an ace in a hole that we have. And even the jihadi leaders recognize this, and they're scared to death of it. More than our military, they're afraid of the seductive cap 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 capability of our, of our ideals. And <laughs> we're doing almost nothing to realize those nightmares that they have. And I want to see if you guys could give some input as to how you think we can make some of those nightmares come true. Thank you. Ted, you want to start? Well, yeah, I mean, it's basically one of my principal points is we are not fighting the ideological war. We have to define what the sides are we have to define who the enemy is, which we've not really done. And we have to recognize that parts of Islam are really, well, most of Islam is really more an ideology than it is a religion. And Bush was so taken up with the idea of a religion of peace, he never understood or never bothered to understand that we need to fight this war. And you fight this war by relentlessly talking about how bankrupt the jihadi ideology is. You don't have to attack Islam, although you're going to sometimes. But the basic point here is you have to have the whole government engaged, which is not now. It's not going to be at least until 2017. And you're not going to be able to do that unless you're willing to take on the fundamental idea to say, you guys are wrong. People deserve freedom. And the fact is you're bankrupt. Your ideology is false. Until you hear those words coming out of our military, coming out of our government otherwise. It's just like Pete Case was saying, as I pointed out earlier, if you understand the ideological war, you understand that what you say, what you write, and what you broadcast is just as important, if not more so, than what you shoot. And we have to have a joint effort, not just a kinetic war, we have to have what we utterly do not have now, which is an ideological fight. We don't, well, we could do it. We've done it before. We could use the old World War II slogan, we can do it again. And we need to. When we fought communism, we were relentless. We were saying that their ideology was false, it was fraudulent, it was based on mangled facts and false information. And we need to start returning that. When a terrorist says, you know, we're all going to go uh, and, and be able to bomb the United States because we'll be rewarded in heaven. Well, really, how do you know? Where does it say that? And that's a bunch of baloney. How do you know something else? Nice? Well, they say it in the Quran, of course. But the point really comes down to we have to take on the lies. You have to call them lies. You have to label the people who are issuing them liars. And we've never been willing to do that. Until you do, you can't, and again, you can't win the kinetic war without winning the ideological war, too. Well, we've learned, I think, how to love freedom but not how to defend it. And one of the ways you defend it is, as Jed has suggested, but it's not only a question of pointing out the lies of the other side, but talking about the attributes and merits of the system. And one of the reasons why I even made my introductory comments is because I'm deeply concerned that there aren't enough Americans who understand what is unique and idiosyncratic about our own system. And as long as you've seen the coming down of the American education system, it is really very difficult to conceive of how we fight this war by understanding what is truly romantic and extraordinary about the American system that we have. Can Tony? I uh, add one point? Oh, please, I'm sorry. Just uh, one add on, uh, one point on, on this issue. There is a difference between a war of ideas waged within liberal democracies or ex-liberal democracies, as was the case in the uh, ex-Soviet Union, East Europe, and in the Muslim world. And those differences are deep. In the West, ideas can fight ideas because the customers, citizens, can choose and listen to one, listen to the other, and then we do the argument and counter-argument, and one would win in the balance. In the Arab and Muslim world, most of it at least, 
there is another problem other than we cannot choose between ideas because some, a set of ideas is dead on arrival. In the Arab and Muslim world, before the Arab Spring, kids from 0 to 6 are with their moms, from 6 to 12 are with the teacher, and after that are with whatever in the neighborhood, the political party, the Ba'athists, the jihadists. So they don't actually have an alternative. When Jed said, you're going to argue with those individuals, we can't get to them. How can we actually get to them? They are completely sealed off from the rest of the world. Which meant that when after 9-11 we wanted to wage the war of ideas, it's not just to have better ideas. We have huge banks of ideas. It's how to get those ideas in those languages to those people, by media, and then by NGOs. Now, who blocked us? Over the past 10 years, who blocked Washington from waging a real war of ideas, of building movements inside those countries of airing the right message from our media. The pushback by the lobbies, by the interest groups, the interest groups that are funded by the Iranian regime, by the Muslim Brotherhood, were the ones who stopped us from reaching out. You want to listen to the voice of America's messages? To Al Hura, our TV, to the other media that we are promoting? Well, good luck, you're going to hear Hamas, you're going to hear Hezbollah. So we had a tremendous failure in conveying our message to those individuals to hope that they can have a choice between one and the other again. Excellent point. I, I should point out that when Al Hura was organized, it was believed that American popular culture would have a profound effect on attitudes in the Middle East. And so what did you hear? You heard Jay-Z and you heard 50 Cent rap music, which if anything led to ammunition for the moles, arguments about the deterioration and degradation of the American culture. So I think your point, your point is well made. We didn't have an appropriate strategy for even reaching those people we could conceivably reach on American media. Uh, please. Now many of us who have attended many of these meetings uh, have been informed and know about the state of being of our country. And we want to know the fact of the matter is that we have someone in the administration was not going to do anything about everything that we know. And we have to wait to 2016 and pray that we change the administration. I want to know what we can do with that fact. They cannot, we cannot wait three years for this change to take place, hopefully to take place. While this president the Congress will not do anything. We cannot wait because three years will be far too late, as we all know, and we just talked about it, because Iran will do what they're doing and be three years in better shape. Now, what do we do? How do we do go beyond this government that will do nothing? Tell me, thank you. Everything that has to be done has to be done physically. 
Uh, let me just point one thing out, and it's very obvious, of course. 2016 is indeed three years away, two years away. But 2014 is just over the horizon. And while this will not lead to a change in the imperial presidency, it could lead to an enormous paralytic environment in Washington, which I think would be very healthy. So a lot depends on this election. And if, in fact, the Republicans were a smart party, there were dubious points to begin with, but if they were the smart party and had someone who would create what I would call the contract for 2014, which went beyond Obamacare and talked about foreign policy issues, Benghazi, Iran, uh, Crimea, uh, it seems to me that the party could generate some support for a foreign policy initiative. Uh, this it depends, of course, on the kind of leadership we have in the party. At the moment, Speaker Boehner wants to concentrate on only one issue. He doesn't want us to be distracted. But I think people are intelligent enough to understand that there's more than one issue we can incorporate into our mindset at the same time. And certainly foreign policy should be one of those matters. Yes, please, Orna, would you wait for the microphone? Could Amanda ask her question? Oh, I'm, I'm sorry. You have the microphone, Amanda. Please excuse me. Oh, um, this Amanda. is Amanda Bowman, by the way. Last week, we had a conference um, on preserving an open society in the perilous world. Andy McCarthy was a speaker, Judge McKay, and Judy Miller was here earlier. A very interesting presentation was made by uh, an expert on cybersecurity. And the point that he made actually was an unusual one, and I'd like to have the um, panel comment on. His, he, he picked up an iPhone and showed it to the audience, and he said, this is the greatest example American soft power and how it's been projected globally. So my question, and then he went into some length about exactly how this is reaching poor and, and, and disenfranchised in, this, in, in the nations that we've been discussing. Uh, to take a, not, at the risk of being a bit of a Pollyanna, I'd like to ask the panel what they thought the opportunity for the projection of soft American power as opposed to hard military power exists for us now. One little point. Here here. Doug and we could develop the best, and we've done in the past, the best technologies. I mean, many of the youth in the Middle East who rose against the Brotherhood and those who rose against uh, the Ayatollahs and those who rose against Hezbollah, what do you think they used? In the Cedars Revolution in Lebanon 2005, they used texting. It was called the SMS Revolution. It allowed a million people to come together. In Iran, though not successful at the end, the Green Revolution used Twitter until it was shut down. In Egypt, it was Facebook, uh, 85,000 like in three days and then tens of thousands. But that, these are instruments used by them. The problem is that we are developing a technology that is going very fast and our ideas are very going backward. Meaning, unfortunately, on our great technologies, if you look at the ad, the commercials, and you know, in Apple and any other mean that we have, who do you think they consult? Who do you think the multinational corporations in America consult? They consult our Middle Eastern studies elite when they can afford ideas. So they, you know, the example of this camel to be built in uh, Pakistan's embassy, U.S. embassy, is culture of a camel because some advisor told them that the camel represents what the Pakistanis want was a big mistake. So there need to be a reform of ideas here in America, in Middle Eastern studies, in academia, I know it's, time is not you know, very, very uh, generous with us, as we are developing these technologies, that would be my little contribution. Okay, one, uh, uh, so I'm sorry, go ahead. Yeah, go ahead. I think there is a huge amount of room for soft power, but soft power has to be applied. And in terms of what we're going to try to gain, in terms of the application of soft power, there's no fault at this point within this administration. When you couple a ideological war with soft power, then you can have people active, say, broadcasting on Voice of America saying, you know, the jihadis have really been giving you guys a bad deal. And at the same time, they would be phones delivering SMS text messages, and there would be things all over the radio, there would be things in an underground press. That's what we need to do. And, and you know, Tony, I can't tell you how much what you're saying really bothers me because I don't have a good answer. 
because there's nothing that I can think of, and I'd love to hear ideas, but there's nothing that I can think of that's going to work in the next couple of years. There's not, just not something, but the soft power is certainly available to us, but it has to be connected, and the way to connect it is with a concerted effort on ideological warfare. No, did you want to add to that? No, I'd like to do that. Oh, go ahead, then. Warner, you, you've been very patient, so. Oh, Robert, and well, Warner and then Robert, go ahead. Warner, that's our hand up. This is Warner Shulman. Well, the hypocrisy in this administration has been palpable, so what you suggested is clearly true. Almost not a word is spoken about the atrocities that have occurred in the Sudan, and yet Israel is daily demonized in the United Nations. So it, it is clear that this is not at all a, a fair and open playing field. I had the opportunity to have dinner with Ban Ki-moon on one occasion, and I said to him, when we were talking about UN affairs, I said, it seems to me that there's one very simple principle that you should use. Treat Israel as you would every other state. <laughs> Don't give it any advantage or any disadvantage. Treat it as you would any other state. And he just smiled, because Israel is treated differently. So from my point of view, yes, hypocrisy is very much on the world stage. We see it in our own administration, but we see it worldwide, and we certainly see it in the United Nations. Uh, Ruth. And then Robert. I, I would like to ask um, Wally or as a question because you brought it up. You brought up um, Egypt. Now in, in, in an area devoid of real uh, civil, real civil unrest, you do have the outbreak of something interesting in Egypt with the advent of Al Sisi. I know I like him because Obama doesn't, <laughs> but I'd like you to comment on those, those possibilities in All Egypt. Like that. Well, they want you repeat the question. And was... I, I, I repeat it in my answer. I mean, okay. uh, uh, the lady was asking, our friend was asking about position with regard to General Al Sisi, Abdel Fattah Al Sisi in Egypt, who is now running as a candidate, uh, most likely to be elected as a president. Uh, what's the actual assessment? You're going to be surprised by my answer. What would guarantee that Al Sisi may act? continue to act, by the way, against Al-Qaeda, against the Brotherhood, and will most likely 
be a containing force against Iran after he's elected with the other Arabs in the region is not the fact that he's in the military. It's the fact that he has the support of 33 million Egyptians, something that has never happened before. Now, you're right to mention that we are still in America uncertain about civil society in Egypt. I have spent my last two years, maybe more, focusing on what are Egyptians saying, what are non-Muslim Brotherhood people saying. Now, certainly there are many people in Egypt who are reminiscent of the Nasser era, or let's go back to Russia. This is in the old ailing elite that was in the past. What you see right now are youth movements who are on Facebook, on YouTube, who do not want something very different from what we want. They may not like our foreign policy, and by the way, if they don't like our foreign policy today, I feel closer to them. That's a, that's a good point, it's not to like our foreign policy, but I would be more positive and reassuring, knowing what I know. I followed what artists and comedians in Egypt are saying. The difference is that we in America, we don't hear them. I hear them because I'm 24-7, and then our delegation is going to Egypt. What needs to be done, and that answers the, the question of the gentleman here, what can we do between now and 2016? And maybe between now and November, between November and 2016, that governments cannot do that, you know, if, if we're not in charge, we can't do it. It's people-to-people -people relationship. We can certainly invite many delegations from civil society in Egypt, those who speak English, and English with the best accent possible, to come to the United States, they will go to our campuses, they will go to our media, and they will tell them what were the threats of the Muslim Brotherhood, and they will tell them what really Egypt wants. We need to have this partnership, civil society to civil society, and we need to have our NGOs, our foundation, going to Egypt, going to wherever we can in the region, to tell them that this foreign policy does not really represent what the majority of American public by instinct would like to see. So we can establish this bridge, nobody can cut it, but we have to be organized for it. Thank you. Would you be making a, a report when you return from Egypt? Certainly. Well, the, yeah. uh, the London Center is going to provide a report when we return. Uh, we are leaving on the 13th and uh, this month, and I'm returning on the 18th, and there will be a report sometime in the following week. So yes, that is our goal. Robert, you've been very patient. Yes. Um, Wally kind of read my mind, touched on what I was going to say somewhat, but there was, oh, quite a few years back, there was a report from the CIA saying increasingly in world affairs, the influence of non-state actors is going to come to fore, and Al-Qaeda is an example of that. So we talk a lot about, well, this war of ideas is probably not going to happen until we get someone in the house who's engaged in it. But <clears throat> could we not, as Holly was saying, civil society to civil society, or create a tea party-like network of like-minded people to start spreading these ideas? Because the information technology makes it easy to spread ideas. You know, it used to be you had to run governments in order to spread ideas because information was spread through command and control systems. But increasingly, that's not the case. And even getting into universities, yes, you can get into universities, you can go around universities with the information technology. So a good project, and I'm kind of, you know, revealing my hand, is to create our own network first of spreading these ideas and having, and trying to create a Tea Party, a global Tea Party-like movement. First, you know, as Wally said, you have the spread of ideas within liberal democracies, but you have the spread of ideas within these places where how, how do we spread the ideas first within the places we can spread it? That's the first step. And then, so you have a foundation from which the ideas can be launched. And once we do that, how do we get it into these places where it's harder to crack? And so maybe we could sit down and, and you know, get this in, in motion. And once we get it in motion, the governments, you know, maybe they fall in line. But I think if we're waiting for policy makers to do this, we're going to be waiting a long time. I think it's a good point. I don't think that we can wait for policy makers, and I have very little confidence in the directions that would be provided by this government. But the one thing that I do want you to know is that our contingent going to Egypt is not supported by any government. This is civil society to civil society. We are meeting with leaders in Egypt of every considerable color and, 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 and concept. And so our goal is to try and understand what is going on and to reveal the same sort of notions to the American public when we return. So this is not a government enterprise in any way, shape, or form. Entirely subsidized by the private sector. Herb, can I make a comment? Yes, please. Yeah, uh, I want to pour a little cold water. <laughs>
uh, some of these suggestions. In, in the uh, in Egyptian election that was won by Morsi, uh, the liberal parties all put together uh, got something like 2% of the vote. Uh, they are not, I mean, people say, well, they have to have time to organize. Okay, but the fact of the matter is, I like al-Sisi because he's against the Muslim Brotherhood. And I think the Muslim Brotherhood is one of the prime uh, groups that are the enemy. Uh, so as far as he's, I mean, I, I'm willing to forgive some of his uh, unpleasant actions uh, because he is suppressing and possibly will help destroy the Muslim Brotherhood. Uh, the second point, I'll just quickly tell you a story. I, I was among some people who signed a petition to get Ayman, Ayman Noor out of jail. Mubarak put him in jail because he ran against Mubarak in the election. And he was the great liberal hope uh, of, of the West. First thing he did when he got out of jail, however, was uh, say that we have to reconsider the uh, treaty with Israel and dump his wife. Now, I mention, I, mention that, I mention that because it's in such sharp contrast to what um, Natan Sharansky did when he got out of jail because, and his wife too had worked very hard to get him out of jail. Uh, and she had by then become very religious. He's not. Anyway, he, he, he did not, far from dumping her, he found a way of maintaining their marriage. So, just a small point. Uh, the, the, other, the other thing is, I look back uh, to uh, the 1970s, uh, which were uh, similarly depressing to anyone who was worried about the, the outcome of the Cold War. Uh, we were cutting defense, we were, uh, the CIA, the intelligence agencies were being attacked and destroyed. Our overt capacity for fighting the Soviets was being undercut and our covert capacity was also being undercut. And it looked bad. Uh, the idea that we were a united nation all fighting the communists is ridiculous. There was tremendous dissension, and particularly in the 70s. Now, those of us who were on the, the side that's comparable to the side we're on now uh, set about pressing these points, not to the, not to the uh, East Europeans, uh, but to our fellow citizens. We spent five, more than, well, nearly 10 years uh, banging away at the danger that was posed by the Soviet Union uh, the, and, the, and communism. Uh, and we also banged away on the glories of American civilization and why it was worth defending. Uh, I think we had some effect that is on the climate of opinion and the, the climate of opinion that made it possible for someone with the ideas that Ronald Reagan held to get elected uh, in 1980, there was no way he would have been, could have been, or anybody like him could have been elected in 76. So although we, you know, we don't have a lot of time, I think the, the only realistic alternative is for people like us to keep making the case here. And to hell with the universities, that they're, they're beyond redemption. Uh, and uh, we, <laughs> And there are other ways, there are, we have our magazines, we have our organizations, uh, and, uh, uh, it, and there's no reason why the case can't be, can't be pressed uh, if there's at least some agreement among people like ourselves as to what the case is, uh, namely the, uh, what Kern calls the romance of American history, why America is a glory and should be defended wholeheartedly, uh, and why uh, what we confront in the jihadist or Islamo-fascist, I insist on that term, the Islamo-fascist enemy uh, is evil, and we're good. Uh, Ronald Reagan once said that, what was his purpose in the Cold War, he said, we win, they lose. Uh, and we have to take that attitude ourselves. But the war, it's the war at home that, I, uh, that has to be fought. Not, not the war abroad, I mean the war of ideas. Uh, as you discuss these things, I would ask you to keep a couple of things in mind. If you look at the world, you look at the polling data that we have for it, 
wherever the United States military is not present in great numbers, we tend to be well liked. Wherever the US military is present in great numbers, we are not well liked. And I had personal experience of that. I lived outside the country for 10 years, and when I was in Germany, I was there twice as an officer, and I lived there for 10 years. Uh, it was very clear that in Bavaria, we were extremely unpopular because we're 200,000 of us. Uh, we were only good for uh, income to the local businesses, but otherwise we were widely disliked. As soon as I went to northern Germany, up near Hamburg, Bremerhaven, Hanover, they loved us. They thought the United States was great, thought the American military was great. We need to keep that in mind. Exporting liberal democracy at gunpoint is disastrous. It's a failure. It hasn't worked. It won't work. When we go back to World War II and we look at Germany and Japan, we forget the conditions at the end of those wars were very different from anything that we've confronted since then. Secondly, the Germans and Japanese were actually responsible for what happened. This is, this is something Americans need to understand because we like to think of ourselves. We have this narcissism. We did everything. It's all because of us. General Clay pointed out, he was the commander of the U.S. occupation in Germany, he said, I commanded everything that happened in Germany after World War II from the desk in my office to the door of my office. The Germans did everything else. They did, because they wanted to, and also because it was a cultural foundation that was ready to do it. And the government that emerged was not our government. It was a restoration of the imperial German government that had already been there. Something similar happened in Japan. George Kennan was flown to Japan in 1946 by the Secretary of State to meet with MacArthur. MacArthur had done what he was ordered to do. He had locked up all of the evil industrialists and, industrialists and militarists who had waged war. And Japan was rapidly on its way to becoming a communist country. George Kennan said, General MacArthur, you must release all of the criminals immediately, put them to work rebuilding Japan. They did. They're called the Liberal Democratic Party of Japan. And my point is, if the cultural foundations are there, they were there in Japan, they were there in Germany, the literacy rates were high, the educational levels were high, the readiness to cooperate was there for all sorts of reasons that had to do with the war. You have great potential for success. But if you go to these other areas that we've been discussing, it's a very different world. Literacy is not high. Understanding is not high. The culture is radically different. The people are radically different. And history says that what, what, what lasts, what works, are things that the people in the country and in the region build for themselves, not what others impose on them. Every European power, and we have discovered that that is true in the Muslim world. If they build it, it has a chance of lasting. If we impose it, it will fail. So I would argue that this soft power conversation is enormously important. And I would also argue that what the London Center is doing is the right solution. U.S. government. Doug, let me uh, just make one final comment. I know there are other questions here, but I promised that we would end at 12 o'clock. Uh, this, there is something of lugubrious mood in much of what has been discussed today. And I do not think that we can impose our will on other nations, as Doug has pointed out. But I leave you with a somewhat different thought. That is the standards that we apply to ourselves. The notion of what the American nation means can easily be overlooked. When there were young people who I had the great pleasure of meeting who created the Statue of Liberty in Tiananmen Square roughly a decade ago, these young people didn't build the Eiffel Tower. They didn't build the pyramid. They built the Statue of Liberty because that light in the Statue of Liberty is something that they wanted to emulate. It is the light of freedom. It is the light of a democratic republic. We serve as that kind of model. It is important for Americans to remember that we are a model for many nations in the world. And the things that we believe in and the conditions that we have created for this unique freedom that we enjoy is something that many people across the globe want to share as well. And so I leave you with that thought because that is, in the end, one of the things that we are trying to recreate, a sense of what makes the United States unique, why others would embrace it, and why it is so important for the United States to maintain the standard of liberty that we as a nation are privileged to enjoy. Thank you so much for being here. And let me remind you, let me remind you, we are a 501c3.
very much appreciate any contributions that you would make. I thank you very much for coming April 7th in Washington, D.C. in the Senate Office Building. The actual location is the Hart Senate Office Building on April 7th, 12.30 in the afternoon, and this is at room SH902, SH902. Please join us in Washington, D.C. on that occasion, and thank you very much for being here today.